It is 6.05 p.m. on Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I would ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak to please mute their connection until such time as they're recognized by the chair. Uh, first, I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Daniel Riccardelli is traveling. He will not be with us tonight. Uh, Venket Holly. Are oh, you Venket? Uh, you uh, Venket, are you here? Yeah. Yep. Sorry. There we go. Uh, Elaine Hoffman. Here. Thank you. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. Great. Thank you. Um, here on behalf of the town, we have Colleen Ralston, the zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you with us. And I believe uh, Marisa Lau is also with us. Yes. Hi, Christian. Hi. Welcome. Uh, here on behalf of the board, uh, Paul Haverty, our technical review consultant. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, also, we have Sean Reardon from Tetra Tech. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And then we have Cliff Bomer from Davis Square. I'm here. Wonderful. Uh, we also, have from the applicant, we have uh, Paul Feldman with us. Good evening. Uh, good evening. And I believe we're also joined by Matt and Paul Maschiori. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, I'm sorry. Thanks. No, no, no. Okay, so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue meeting, holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to public meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online tele and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on this meeting's agenda or on the town's website unless otherwise noted. And I will note now that there were a there was a flurry of new documents that came in this afternoon. They have not all been able to be posted um, due to the, the timing on that. I apologize for that. Um, they will all be included on the record on the uh, the website for this project um, as very soon as we can. Um, the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in order to post an orderly meeting. Um, turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Millbrook to be located at 1021 through 1027 Massachusetts Avenue. This evening, the board is continuing the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Millbrook, the redevelopment of an existing site in the neighborhood office B1 district. The submitted documents are available from the board's website or as an attachment to the posted agenda. This evening, we plan to receive an update on the status of the uh, wetlands permit hearing before conservation, uh, the Conservation Commission conditions and comments from board's consultants. And if the board is satisfied that all information that is required to reach a decision has been received, the board may vote to close the public hearing this evening. After members of the board have had an opportunity to ask their questions to the applicant, the hearing will be open for public comment and questions on the topics discussed this evening 
The board has reached the end of the scheduled hearings for this project under state law as extended by consent of the applicant. The public hearing phase of this project must conclude before April 30th, 2023. The board will hear public comment this evening on, on topics related to what materials presented tonight. The comments from the public which are not received by the time the board closes the hearing cannot be accepted into the record. And at the conclusion of public comment, the board will discuss whether there's a need for an additional session or if the board is prepared to close the public hearing. So at this point, I would like to introduce attorney Paul Feldman to um, start off tonight's proceedings. Uh, good evening, members of the zoning board. My name is Paul Feldman. I represent the applicant 1025 Mass Ave LLC. Um, we were last before the board on Monday, April 20th. Um, at which time um, the applicant uh, presented um, all the information um, that we thought the board had asked us to present um, in all the prior meetings. And we felt that uh, we had given the board everything uh, necessary for it to render a decision. Um, we submitted uh, revised plans that um, uh, brought up to date all of the comments and changes that have been made through the six months of uh, public hearing so that the board has in its records the uh, most complete and update set of drawings that it can reference in in a decision uh, if it chooses to grant the requested permit. Um, when we, uh, the, the other thing we covered on April 20th was um, Mr. Haverty had prepared a uh, draft uh, decision. Um, um, we discussed it. Um, comments um, were received uh, by us and, and from others. Uh, Mr. Klein um, also uh, provided some information and we were asked to propose any changes that we thought appropriate um, and get them to Mr. Haverty, uh, which, which we did. Um, and uh, we were also asked to update the requested waiver list um, to pick up a couple of uh, additional waivers that, uh, upon review of the application, we realized were necessary uh, for this project. And that was also submitted. Um, um, we indicated that we had a hearing coming up, which was, was held last Thursday night with the Conservation Commission. Uh, the, the hearing was uh, a public hearing on the notice of intent under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, at that hearing, um, the Conservation Commission um, um, went through a uh, proposed order of conditions that uh, it was contemplating issuing the applicant. Um, the Conservation Commission um, agent had put together approximately 51 conditions uh, that they thought were appropriate um, to, um, uh, in order to grant an order of conditions under the State Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, the hearing lasted about three hours because uh, the commission gave the applicant an opportunity to go through those 51 conditions and um, um, provide comment. Uh, we did that, um, and uh, by the time we were uh, completed, um, 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 the Conservation Commission had all our comments, and uh, the Conservation Commission seemed satisfied that um, uh, the issues they wanted addressed uh, uh, should be addressed. Um, the Conservation Commission closed its public hearing. Um, and proceeded to vote um, and unanimously granted an order of conditions for the uh, requested project at 1021-1027 Mass Avenue. Um, we requested the Conservation Commission, if they were able to, uh, to deliver to the zoning board um, the conditions that uh, they thought um, were appropriate for the zoning board to consider. Um, in connection with the local bylaw, uh, wetland bylaw that is issued pursuant to this comprehensive permit proceeding, which we've been in. Um, I saw an email earlier today that the Conservation Commission did so submit that um, to the uh, zoning board. Um, 
I reviewed uh, what was submitted to the zoning board and the conditions conform to the conditions that was voted upon last Thursday night by the Conservation Commission. Um, I've also looked at the uh, latest draft decision uh, that was circulated by Mr. Haverty. Um, the whole goal uh, with regard to at least wetlands protection is to try to have um, both the order of conditions under the State Wetlands Protection Act and to the extent that the local bylaw is issuing a permit under the local wetlands bylaw for this project to have any conditions conform so they don't they don't conflict they conform with one another and and we know the rules of the road going forward um, I suggest to the zoning board that it um, consider uh, when it um, deliberates and um, uh, works on its comprehensive permit decision that if it's going to approve this project that it um, import um, virtually wholesale um, all the 51 conditions that the Conservation Commission uh, has proposed under the State Wetlands Protection Act into the comprehensive permit. I say um, almost wholesale because when I went through the conditions, there are a couple of conditions that are drafted for the State Wetlands Protection Act and make reference to the potential issuance under the comprehensive permit. And obviously you will have to modify that condition in the context of it being included in the comprehensive permit. But that's wordsmithing more than it is any, um, any substance. The other thing we would request and the reason why we would ask that the board rely on the conditions as uh, presented by the Conservation Commission for wetlands related matters um, is because while there are some conditions on that subject matter in the draft comprehensive permit that we've received, uh, there are inconsistencies and um, that's exactly what we're trying to clear up. Uh, just to illustrate um, we've spoken to this Conservation Commission about an enhanced monitoring period where we would agree to monitor the development of the uh, woodland restoration forest for a 10-year period. Um, and um, um, there's a draft condition in, in the comprehensive permit that covers that subject. Um, there's also a draft condition that covers the same exact subject in the Conservation Commission's Wetlands Protection Act order of conditions. Um, the Wetlands, the Conservation Commission um, um, wanted certain changes um, that don't appear in the comprehensive permit. For example, they wanted the condition to be clear as to when the monitoring period commences. So they drafted language as to exactly when the monitoring period commences. They also wanted to be clear that they wanted us to achieve 90% uh, survival through the initial monitoring period of three years, um, which uh, in the current draft of the comprehensive permit, it only speaks about 80% survival. And so I'm just trying to illustrate that the Conservation Commission conditions on some of the subjects that are even covered in the comprehensive permit uh, are, uh, are, I think, more thorough. Um, there may be um, some language from the draft comprehensive permit decision that you want to add. That's completely up to the discretion of the board. All that we ask is that um, you avoid conflicting <laughs> Uh, requirements um, so that uh, we we have a clear understanding of what our obligations are going forward if a permit should issue. Um, the So that's where things stand with the Conservation Commission. I think you have everything you need uh, from them and um, um, you're, you're in a position to address uh, conditions for the local order of conditions um, in this comprehensive permit. Uh, my final thing that I'd, I'd like to say, and I'll turn it back over to the chair, is um, I'd like the opportunity to 
um, provide uh, certain information and in respond to certain open items in the current version of the draft decision. So we can give the applicants feedback on a couple of points. Um, so the board has our position um, known to it when it deliberates on um, uh, the uh, requested comprehensive plan. So when, if, if the uh, chair allows and when the time is right, I could quickly do uh, 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 an ind indication, some of which are just cleaning up typos, some of which are a little bit more substantive and provide the applicant's feedback. Matt? Mr. Chairman, yes. Um, yes. In addition to, to Paul's comments, I, I, mean, I think it would be, I, I just had a chance to, um, to review um, the merging of our, the, 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 the decision that um, we had most recently marked up with um, the decision marked up by attorney Haverty and um, just getting, you know, through a lot of that this afternoon. And I, I do have some, some comments for discussion. So um, I guess somewhat similar to what we did with the, with the uh, conservation commission, um, I would like to quickly go through this decision and address some things that, um, that um, could, you know, could be, uh, could be an issue for us or, or just at least discuss those, those items if we have the opportunity. Okay. And this is in addition to the stuff we discussed last time. Oh yes, because the red line that we sent to to uh, to uh, yeah. almost recently um, has some conflicting uh, it kind of conflicts in areas um, uh, that you know could be problematic mm -hmm. for us uh, on the project. Um, and you know we can I think it's just best to go in order you know through the decision um, if we may. Okay, um, <clears throat> just. First, briefly, I wanted to go through. Um, so these are findings that were prepared by the Conservation Commission and requested to be a part of the comprehensive permit. Um, the first, the project meets the Arlington Wetland Regulations climate change standards through consideration of climate change, resilient native plantings, native plants control, stormwater management system. Um, the only question I had for the applicant was, they specifically mentioned NOAA 14 plus plus, and but I think you guys only use NOAA 14 plus, which was is what is currently listed in our documentation. And I just wanted to see if you knew specifically which way it is. It's it's plus plus. It is double plus. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and then the second was the project includes a small amount of impact in the outermost portion of the adjacent upland resource area, which is defined in the Arlington Wetlands Regulations. The impact is mitigated by the significant improvements made to the restored wetland area, which is partly within the Aura and Holy in the riverfront area. So essentially these comments from them are just stating that um, the application as it stands today uh, is, is essentially in compliance with the Arlington Wetlands Bylaws. Um, so we will make sure that those get included. Um, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Mr. Hanlon. This is, I'm getting used to it. This is a point of order, I think. But is it possible <clears throat> as we go through this, especially if we go, as we go through Mr. Haverty's uh, decision and deal with the comments that the applicant has, if it's possible to make this bigger so that it's actually legible on the screen, but I, oh. I can't read what we have here, uh, even on my big model. I can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so at this point, I was going to go from here on to um, the final submitted comments from uh, from Sean Reardon from Tetra Tech. Um, is that easier to read, Pat? It is now, yeah. Okay. Um, Christian, not to answer, um, these are all up on the um, town website, too, if they need to see them. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so essentially, so these are updates, updates. Um, so here's the first one, Sean, that's dated as today's date, um, which is just that the vinyl fence is going to be replaced by cedar. And, and that, that has been confirmed in the um, Conservation Commission's uh, documentation. So that is noted as resolved. 
Um, this is about the traffic study and the some document some additional documentation requested. It's been resolved. Um, number sixty seven. Um, so this, this is really the only thing substantive that, ha that that not really hasn't been resolved, but um, you know all of the other comments reflect that the applicant has addressed the prior comments. This yeah. is just something that I think just you know in 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 closing is worth considering. It's it's not a not a requirement by any means, but um, it's something that I wasn't sure if it had ever gotten resolved in any sort of conclusive way. You know, the the there is still it just it feels like there's a a lack of loading space for the facility. I know they can get into the garage and use that, but it seems like we've got a, a pretty good solution out front by just um, sort of replacing the the existing on-street parking that's out there right now with a, a loading zone. Uh, it does a couple things that I think you yield some some clear benefits. One is it in, increases sort of the sight distance available to cars exiting the garage. Um, as, you, as you know, if cars are parked there, you can't see you know, to the east as well as you, you could otherwise. Granted, if there's someone loading, it's kind of a similar problem, but you're going to have a lot of, a longer periods of time where there's not going to be anybody there. It's going to help people as they're exiting. And then just, it, it's just a, a good way that, that the building will have some open space out in front of it for, you know, as everybody knows, the amount of delivery vehicles now with Amazon making multiple de deliveries during the day, FedEx and Postal Service, just a, a much more convenient way to sort of serve the building. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I, if I just could point Mr. out- Mr. Feldman? Yeah, the recommendation here is that a condition, uh, that, a, that the board consider a condition requiring this. I, I, I think it's it's not up to the board to, um, to, to reallocate the parking spaces that probably the selectmen or the DPW. So I, if you're gonna draft a condition on this subject, I ask, that it be written as that the applicant um, request modification yeah. of the parking spaces and uh, uh, certain parking spaces in front of the building to be uh, a loading zone instead of on street parking. We'll make that request, but we can't, if it's a direct condition and somebody denies that request, then we'll be in violation of our permit. So I'm just stating the obvious. And yeah, the point no, I yeah, and the only thing I, I I also want to point out is we wouldn't want to convert all of the spaces. I, I think it's the ones that you're sort of adjacent to the access drive because there is a commercial um, uh, space in the building uh, that would benefit from having a couple of on-site spaces. We have plenty of frontage. I think the, the Mr. Reardon's idea is a, is a very good one. It's just when, if the board agrees with this idea and it's going to draft a condition just just cover the fact that all we can do is request and we wouldn't seek to have all of the off street parking removed, just just a, a sufficient amount to create the loading zone concept that Mr. Reardon just described. Okay, well, thank you for that. And yeah, as everyone has already said, the board is not within the board's discretion to um, to reallocate the, the street spaces. Um, They have a, this current one. Um, yeah, you'll find all, all, all of them have been resolved. Yeah, and th there's two resolved. there's two piddly little comments that I added at the end that in case other revisions are are required, they just might want to clean them up a little bit. But by no means do they have to be. The plans have to be changed to address those two minor comments. Yeah, that's just eighty and eighty one. It was just a numbering issue on some of the drawings. Yeah, so that, that's, that's it. One was. That's it. Yep. Perfect. Of that, um, I was going to quickly go over to the last set of comments. Um, these are from uh, Cliff Bomer. Um, so this is based on an on, on the first draft we had put out. Um, so it's some of the surrounding stuff has changed, but I did want to get to the ones that. Uh, Oops, Cliff had mentioned. Um, the first up, this is um, under landscaping, just the tree protection and preservation plans that it should include trees on neighboring sites. There was discussion 
uh, in the rear, uh, towards the rear of the property on the right hand side. Right. Um, that protecting those trees that are adjacent to the property line. I just want to make sure that that's yeah. included. So, a point of order, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, that, that's not that's not the right. I would I would suggest that's not the right place to add that concept. There there is a later condition um, that talks about uh, protecting um, uh, trees, and this yeah. is about the plan for for the project site, and so. Uh, this I would add this concept. I think it's already covered later in the decision, uh, and I could point it out. Okay. But if it's not sufficiently covered, I just think this concept belongs in the other condition that's already there. Okay. Um, then an, um, the construction mitigation plan. Uh, are the final plans, the permit drawings, to submitted to the building department or the submitted a few weeks ago to the ZBA of the former. Um, so the bill, the, I had in, inquired of the town as to whether on 1165 R Mass Ave, which is the uh, comprehensive permit that's under construction currently up the street, um, as to whether they required the hiring of additional uh, reviewers for those applications. And I was told they did not. Mm -hmm. Um and so, um, and the applicant has requested that the 45 days, I believe in this case, be re reduced to 30. Is that correct, Paul? Uh, it, that's correct. And the, this language has changed to say that um, um, you would hire someone only if the town didn't have the expertise or uh, correct. To, to, to address the, the issue on their own. So, this is the older version. Um, this concept has already yeah. also been addressed. I apologize for marking up the older version. No, Sorry. that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, then here, um, uh, so, so the architectural yeah. plans, you're saying it should be full construction documents? Yeah, and that's that's just because I don't recognize architectural plans as a term of art. So it, it's really a much broader um, array of plans that need to be submitted and approved. So it's a detail, uh, it's an edit. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it adds any burden onto the applicant. It's what the building inspector would expect to see. We're fine with it. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then sprinkler system contractors shall prepare for building commissioners review well-developed NFPA 241 plan that ensures life and property safety during construction period. I'm, I think that's a building code requirement as well. Well, sort of. Okay. And, I, and Christian, you're right. That's generally been my impression as well. But I've uh, recently done some hearings in other towns where there appears to be ambiguity about the degree to which the code actually does require it. My only comment on this section was, since the decision is wading into very specific NFPA requirements, I would hate for that one to be missed. Okay. It is normal, and I'll, I'll, I will just add one um, emphasis point, which is, uh, th this is a kind of infill project. It's between a small wood frame building on the right hand side and a multifamily masonry building on the left hand side. And if there were any uh, serious issues during construction, you'd want to be sure that that was a requirement, um, whether or not there was ambiguity in the code about whether it's enforceable. Great, thank you. Um, under construction completion, uh, provide a letter to the board signed by the applicant civil engineer certifying the structure and supporting infrastructure. And their comment was to include architect and other engineers in that uh, yeah, final I just, sign. -up. I just have never seen this language that would limit this kind of certification to the civil engineer. That's the only reason I added that. Right. No. I'm sure Mike Novak doesn't want to certify anything on the building no <laughs> that, was, that was my main point 
not to demean the the profession of civil engineering, but it, it doesn't it doesn't check all boxes. Yeah, um, I agree. This uh, E eight was a little bit, and we've sort of been massaging this language as well. Um, okay. That <clears throat> electric heat and electric hot water is the intent for the project, um, and that so that has been fixed. Um, Terrific. Okay. Great. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Matt. Um, I'm yes, not Mr. quite Hamlet. sure I understood the, the most recent thing. Does that mean that that in what you know that we are no longer looking at reasonably available language and it's just straight out uh, heat and water? Or is there? I mean, what is the resolution? I gather there is a resolution, but I don't know what it is. So what? when we come, uh, so when we come back to the the updated draft and we go through um, the other questions, it will come back to this one. Okay. It's resolved the way you believe, Mr. Hanlon. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is getting a little confusing looking at a pre previous version, for sure. I No, I just wanted to make sure that we covered the topics and then we'll move on. Um, the proposed spaces coming to structured garage spaces and surface parking spaces. Um, it's just a typo level. Just... Okay. Yeah, because we don't actually have any surface Correct. parking spaces technically. They're all, so. they're all structured parking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the stairways, garages. I think we've run into this one before. Yeah. Um, because it's a pedestal, a podium building, it's actually a three hour separation. Um, and so I think what the board should consider is just saying that the, um, that the fire ratings must be per the building code rather than being specific go. about. Yes. That's right. It shouldn't be prescriptive. Yep. Okay. Um, by compliance with all state building code and FPA requirements, fire access and safety shall be met, including during the construction period. That's a reference and, back to the 241 plan. Yep. And then the elevators, that is correct. We're doing an emergency generator back. Uh, uh, um, that's a gas fire generator for the elevators. Right. My, my um, point was that generally and I I think Matt probably agrees with me. Generally, only one of those elevators would be powered by the backup generator. But in in the current yeah, draft, right. it says as required by the Massachusetts Elevator Code. It's it, we've addressed it. Okay, terrific. Yeah. And that's all for that one. It might be it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I did want to comment. I did review the uh, plans as well, all of the um, okay. drawings, and um, I, I'm very satisfied that that uh, most of everything we talked about was really looked at, and much of it integrated into the current set of plans. So uh, I, I just want to point that out that the uh, the conditions and that were the parts that just needed some tweaking from my perspective. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna try to go through these somewhat quickly um, and pick up places where we need to cover stuff. I know, um, at you said you had some that you specifically wanted to address. Um, so I, I think those... it would make sense if we could to, um... Paul, do you have the ability to sh to share your screen with the mer the merge? No, this is no, no. I, That's I, what this I, is. I, I don't. I, I think we got to do it this way. This is the uh, Matt. The, you, if we um, if we just do a page turn when we come up to an item, um, we should just point to the item and, and point out the issue. I I think we got to work yep. off of this draft. We would really confuse things by putting up my writing. So uh -huh. I didn't have anything on the first. Four items, and uh, and I didn't have anything uh, through item twelve. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there are a couple of questions there. Um, is there evidence of assignment in the record? Yes, we we uh, 
provided the board with the assignment of the purchase and sale agreements by both sellers um, to the applicant. So that uh, uh, that that information is part of the record. Yeah, we have both the we have the purchases and sale agreements for both of those properties and, and the assignments. Yeah, can we can we go back? Can we go back up the top? Yeah. What which paragraph number, Matt? Um. So number seven um, continues, unless I'm missing something, continues to go back to 1,658 square feet of ground level of commercial. It's yeah. 1,700, approximately 1,700. It's 1,700, but I just want to make sure that we're getting credit for that additional footage, please. All right, so you want 1,700. Okay. Okay, so that's a change that no. comes up many, many times. Are you going to right. pick that things. up in the construction plans as well? It's, it's 1,700 on the construction plans. The last set of construction plans I had said 1658, which is why I was putting in 1658. So I just want you to make sure you're, you're catching that. Uh, stand by a second. You do have the word approximately in there. That gives you some flexibility. Right. Yeah, I mean, if it turns out to be 1658, approximately 1700 is good enough. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so these right. numbers, I have advised figures for comment three from uh, the Department of Planning and Community Development. So we will incorporate those. And those were from uh, April of, I believe it was April of 2022. And, and, and what's the new percentage? Um, it is... The new percentage six point five four. Oh, good. As of April twenty seventh, twenty twenty two. Um, it's another just another thing that this project is ten twenty one through ten twenty seven, and it still goes back in some places to ten twenty five. Just want to make sure that we're referencing ten twenty one and ten twenty five through ten twenty seven, which is the same as ten twenty one through ten twenty seven. Okay. Um, back to, I'm sorry, um, I just had a question on number five. Um, so it says, additionally, the property contains significant pavement covering approximately 25% of the property. And they're saying for a current total impervious area of 36%, are we suggesting, are we talking about the um, as improved or at, you know fully improved as built percentage at 36%? Is that what that is alluding to? I just couldn't. No, couldn't... that is the current, that is the current as of today impervious area on the site. Yeah, it, the impervious is only changing by a couple of points, Matt. Right. No, no, I, okay. Just just making sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, going down, my next comment is um, just 19. There's In 19, there's a... Okay, we're not there yet, Matt. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and so this, this gets at what you were asking before about 1021 through 1027. So we'll go through, we'll make sure we correct that. Okay. Going forward. Um, and then on 18, uh, it's a, here we, it's looking for a specific number of square feet. The um, information we have from the uh, Conservation Commission just says, you know, a small area. And so as long as everyone's comfortable with adopting their language, I don't think that's an issue. Yeah, it's, it's all the way down at the bottom, next to the parking lot and the uh, and the site. It's yeah. it's right where the first hundred feet is. It's just a little teeny strip. Uh, we don't have right, a square. Exactly. Point. And this uh, number nineteen, we basically have a new text from the Conservation Commission uh, for this. Um, so eighteen and nineteen, we will fix with the new information from ConCon. Yeah, I just um, picked up, and it's one the one typo between restoration and is. Yeah, well, that's going to change that paragraph. They're going to they're going to import the con the con comps paragraph. I understand. I understand. Okay. And, uh, um, there's a typo on twenty three. You just passed it. It's fifty one parking spaces. Okay. It, it was picked up later in the decision, but not here. Okay. 
Um, and then 27. Um, uh, 37.8%. Is the new percentage? Yep. So it will increase the amount. Yep. It's increasing by just a couple points. Okay. But the rest of the paragraph works. The rest of it all works. Okay. And here, what is it inserted? Um, so I think, Paul, were you saying you had wanted to remove the first paragraph, the first sentence, excuse me, in 20, 32? Yeah, no, the, the only concern that I had about that uh, paragraph was um, it was uh, it was regarding the, the traffic that I, that I, my mm -hmm. point was there. There were virtually no traffic concerns raised through the public hearing process, and it felt like that was a holdover from another draft where traffic was a bigger concern. So, um, I, I I just thought that to highlight traffic as if it was an issue, it it wasn't an issue for this particular project, either from the okay. traffic assessment point of view or from public comments. That's why I wanted uh, those couple of words deleted. Okay. This is just going through the documentation that's included. Yeah, there's the 51 parking spaces, 95 bedrooms. Um, you see an A4, you see A4 has that reference to 1658 again. So if we're going to use 1700, just you have to do a search and uh, search and replace. replace because it comes up a lot. Yeah. So A7. Here with A7? Yeah. Um, could we, would uh, the board consider, um, you know, we were at 15, you're at 30, you know, meeting us part way and uh, 30. Well, we started at 45. Yes. I'm sorry. So we went halfway to 30. Good. All right. Good. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get some confirmation on the number of bedrooms in E4? Sure. Absolutely. Because I think, Christian, you had 97 and the applicant had 95, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Paul, do you have a fixed number for that, Paul Feldman? I, I I don't. You know, one thing that happened is I think we lost one bedroom when 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 you added that second access to the oh uh, I see okay to the patio area, right, Matt? Um, yeah, I think we went from ninety seven to ninety six, um, but uh, or ninety five. I'll I'll have that for you um, by the morning. No, no. We got to have that tonight. <laughs> yes, it is tonight. Wait, we can't hear. We, we, we go like this as soon oh, it's, as it's over. Right. So, so can we just say approximately ninety five, and then we don't have to worry about it. either ninety five or ninety six? Yeah, I'd suggest no more than ninety six. We could say no more than ninety six. Right. Ninety six okay. is divisible by four let, too. Let me pull. Let me pull up the applicate the comp application. Um, anything we can do tonight would be fine. It's just that right. we can't. If we close the hearing, we can't. Anymore. No, that's fine to say no more than 96. That works. That's okay. fine. Because I, 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 it's either 95 or 96, so that covers it. Yeah. Um, comment on B4, that's for the board to determine um, how it wants to handle uh, local preference. Um, there was a question here about whether the NPDES permit is necessary, um, but it does here indicate it's obtained and file copy if necessary. So I think if we leave it in, we're not. I think we're under the an issue. under the um, the disturbance that would kick us into NFT's filing. That's why we asked for okay. we required. Um, and then. Again, here was another one where it was 45 and yep. reduced to 30. Um, There's a typo in this last paragraph as you, you right right before you right after the list, 
there's a typo of, of plantings right there of the third monitoring year. Um, and um, this is one of those areas where you may make a highlight. It's inconsistent with the CONCOM. The survival rate that the CONCOM is imposing is 90%. Um, um, so, uh, but and the language is a little bit different because it, they 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 have an actual date by which the monitoring period begins. Mm -hmm. So we, again, we're going to suggest that when you reconcile when the board's working on its own, um, that it 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 conform to the CONCOM's language. Um, okay. This is just one example of it. All right. Um... I think all these things were covered, yeah, in the construction management plan. So, yeah, that, that they have fun. snow storage. We do want to keep snow storage in the um, in here just to keep it fresh and foremost. Um, There's a uh, I, I mentioned this uh, in C two A. Um, you you jump you jump past it. Um, I, um, C two A, there's yep. reference. There's reference to a subdivision plan, but there, that's not applicable to this. Plan. Oh. So it should say record the comprehensive permit by uh, by uh, with the Middlesex. All the subdivision plan through the board should come out. So the comprehensive permit, I guess, it, by definition, is endorsed by the board. Yeah. No, no, it, it wouldn't be endorsed by the board. That that endorse was referring to a subdivision plan, and that was from a different application. So that's perfect. Right. Okay. Easy enough. Um, this was just uh, that the condo doc should uh, address things like snow removal, trash removal, and other such issues. Yeah, so the only thing there is public access. We we would ask that to be, we've already been through this. We we discussed yeah. this. Mr. Haverty has opined on this as well, that um we don't know what you mean by should address issues relating to public access. But people are going to be able to enter the building that are visiting residents of the building, but there's not public access to the site. So that yeah. that that should the words public access should be deleted. Uh well, we do have the retail components, or do we want to? compartmentalize it we could say to relating to public access to the retail space that works mr chairman yes mr dupont so just a small point on this so where it says that copy of the condominium Association Master Deed, I'd like to see Condominium Trust included in there as well after Master Deed, because the rules and regulations are often just promulgated by the trustees, but that doesn't give you a look at what's actually in the trust itself. Okay. Question here, number 17. Um, so this uh, E2 has to, we, 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 yep. we, we suggest changing E2 in a pretty substantive way because the, we would delete it as it's presented here and just say the construction management plan referenced uh, at the outset of this decision mm -hmm. uh, has been reviewed and approved and the, and the applicant shall, shall uh construct the project in conformance with the plan. Okay. Or words to that effect. The, yeah, the, I think our, our previous language you should have that was um we yeah, did our previous language was was referencing an exhibit B, which we don't no longer need because it's been included in the beginning. So no, yeah. but you see the construction management plan has been reviewed and approved and construction of the project shall be performed in compliance with the construction management plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then on E8, I, 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 this is a question for, for that I had for E8. You, you jumped over it. Um, this is the language about the 
project's going to be all electric, including heat, hot water, and appliances. Mr. Hanlon, this was the provision you were asking about. Um, so now it's clear. Natural gas service to provide. And it says solely for backup. Uh, my question is, if uh, we don't have any idea who the commercial users are, but wouldn't it make sense that if a, the commercial uh, user uh, needed to tie into the gas service, they would be allowed to? So we had discussed that last time, and I had been assured that that was not going to happen. Well, we we were pretty confident there wasn't going to be a restaurant because we don't have you know grease traps and everything. But again, we don't we don't know. I mean, I'm mad. I leave that up to you. you, you I you I know. did we I did tell Christian that um you know as we weren't looking to have a restaurant use in there, there there shouldn't be a need for gas you know for cooking or or makeup air. So um I we we expect a pretty low impact use. So I don't want to I I don't want to go back on that at this point. All right. All right. Um, uh, there's a small correction to E13 when you get to it. Yep. Uh, the uh, where it says um, uh, it's it, where it says um, in the third per Title Five, <laughs> Article Twelve, Section Three of the Town Bylaws. Yep. It, it needs to say except as waived herein. Because there's a waiver that covers the hours, but everything else in the Bible will be applicable. All right. Um, question on E15 about referencing the landscape plans. Um, which we can look into. Um, I mean, it's it's spelled down in the landscape plans. So yeah, Actually, that's in the CMP, I believe, for um, temporary stabilization. No, but that that last reference was final stabilization. Yeah, final stabilization. Which no, I think the only places that are long and seated no, are the no sides. building areas shall be left in an open, unstable condition longer than sixty days. That's that's uh, that's to me sounds like a construction item. Which item are you in, Matt? I was in 15. Yeah, so at 15, the last sentence, that's what we're talking about. Right, but I, uh, uh, final stabilization. Final stabilization. Yeah. It, per the land, yes, per the landscape plan. Right. Yeah, that's all, that's all we were yeah. addressing. Yeah. Um, so to the extent that earth removal is necessary, um, the exempt earth removal associated with construction of footings and foundation walls. So this is material that's going to be taken off site correct you know most likely i mean the, the this this earth removal condition is we typically see it when we're in a site that is not balanced with cuts and fills and you're really going to be you know hauling stuff off site it, there's going to be a, a minor amount of earth removal you know for potentially for the you know foundation footings and the foundation walls but that you don't you don't typically develop a whole earth removal plan for that. It's pretty, um, so we would just suggest that given the nature of the earth removal that we would expect at this site, because there are no, um, uh, if the site is balanced generally, that mm -hmm. we shouldn't have to, um, you know, prepare all these plans and, 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 and do things that, you know, it's just, it's just a typical job site uh, issue. Do I, do, do, is that right, Matt? Sure. How about to the extent extraordinary earth removal is necessary? Yeah, we'll come up. We can we can put a bound in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Chair. Yeah, all all of all of the earth removal is incidental to foundation construction. So, I mean, it, to Paul's point, it's it, it's pretty sort of above and beyond, in my opinion. Okay. It would make sense in a site where you, you don't have a balanced site and you really have trucks going in and yeah. out. Okay. Um, uh, catch basins. Um, so so the issue is, is that there are a couple of catch basins that are shown on the plans that are not receiving vehicle water and they're not going to be set up with oil water separators. This mm -hmm. is saying the that... plans all, indicate that, Paul? 
Well, they're in the they're the catch the no, the the plans don't say if the catch basin has an oil water separator or not. This one this says all catch basins are gonna have oil water separators. There are, there are some in the back in the in the in the uh restored forest that 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 don't receive any vehicle water. They're not they're gonna be a catch basin, but they're not gonna have an oil water separator. So yeah, I just is you can, is, you can say all, all catch basins exiting to sewer or to sanitary shall have oil water separators. This comment has a has a lot of issues because in theory a catch basin is an oil water separator. Um, so so I I don't think this adds any value. So if it can be removed, I'd suggest it be removed. The, the whole condition that works for us. Fine with us. Yeah, because because in in theory a catch basin is an oil water separator and. There, there are very different definitions for oil water separators. So you know, between the order of conditions and the other stormwater management requirements, yeah, that you, you've got that covered, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I don't think you need to worry about that. Uh, did, did, okay. Did you go to E28 for a second. I just want to make sure yep. we, I think E28 turned out a little broader than we were expecting. This, this reads that we're going to do pre-construction and post-construction survey of properties within 300 feet. That means we're talking about properties on the other side of Massachusetts Avenue. We were, what, what, what the concern was during the public hearing was the house next door where we're doing the um, foundation of the basement. Support of uh, excavation. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's where the excavation is for that. It's the two family next door. What is it, 1031 um, Mass Ave, I think, or I'm, I mean, I have the number right. But 300 feet within the property is a ton of, of survey for 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 no reason, I, I it it's the three hundred feet that wasn't consistent with what occurred at the at the public comments. Right. So I just want to point that out. We can come back to that. Um, and, and in E twenty E E thirty one, there's a typo. Just if you want to pick it up, uh, it's right there. You know. Yeah. Uh, and, and Mr. Chair, uh, I think it's. Too, uh, the, Correct me if I'm wrong. That it's 250 foot requirement for blasting, so the 300 feet would be okay. Well, it's too. Oh, okay. There is no blasting. That's that's. No, no. I'm saying if, if there were blasting, the requirement is 250 feet. So right. And all, all I'm saying is we, we would like to see the requirement be specific to the property next door, adjacent to our our basement construction. Yeah. Not not on the other side of Mass Ave. I mean that makes just no sense. And then also in E31, it references pest control post occupancy. So, is there an expectation that um, the management company or the HOA, um, you know, has pest control in perpetuity, regardless of whether it's needed or not? Um, I mean, I guess you would have there would be an assessment as to whether there is an issue. That's a Part of the first the first sentence, and then we have to do that for demo be a, and, and for yeah. ongoing you know, operations on on site during construction. Right. And then it's the post occupancy yeah. comment. That's a board of health issue. That's not a comprehensive permit issue. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dupont, or is that Mr. Hanlon? Sorry, this is Mr. Hanlon. Um, we'll have to look at this. I I this is a very difficult issue that is currently pending in town and it's entirely possible i suppose that no integrated test pest management plan is necessary because there won't be any pests um, but it's something that we have to i think hear the applicants view on this and figure out uh figure out what's necessary but i wouldn't jump to the conclusion that it's not within our purview so our, our just so our view is clear we understand that during construction, when you're disturbing potential pest habitat, uh, you got to manage it because all of a sudden, you know, those critters or rodents or pests end up going elsewhere because you're doing construction. And it's very, very common. But after the building is built, um, you know, if there is a rodent problem at the condominium, that really is a, a board of health item. And I, I don't know if it's, it's not, in our, in, in my view, would not it would not be an appropriate condition for post occupancy. That's so you, you've heard it, and I ask you to consider it. Okay. Cliff, did you have a question? 
Uh, I did. I, I think on the previous condition about the surveys of properties, certainly across Mass Ave, mm -hmm. I think is extreme, but I think I would change it to just abutting properties. The building to the west is a masonry building. It is prone to cracking. I think it protects all parties, including the developer, to do a survey of that building as well. Okay. Directly abutting? Yeah, just directly abutting properties would be my suggestion. Just keep in mind, Cliff, that would include the condominium complex because that's a budding property. Yep. So I don't know if that's the intent. No, and that doesn't make sense. The, the building, the condo, the Millbrook condominium building itself is quite far. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we just list the two addresses? I think it's the two mass ave properties well, that, right. that I would cover if I were doing this building. We'll take the two properties to the right. Yeah. Of the there you go. Um. It is out eight outdoor spaces. Um, but that was fine. Yeah, I, um, I suggested some wordsmithing. I know that Paul, Mr. Haverty, was going to do some wordsmithing to to F four. Um, so you may want to just highlight it and talk yep. with Mr. Haverty. Um, yeah. So it, it there are four hoops, which is eight spaces. Yeah, I'm talking about F four, two up from there. Uh, it was is F four. Oh, F four. Yeah, it, it was just yeah. the um, the way this language is written. The applicant shall ensure that emergency vehicles can adequately remove it through the site. Mm -hmm. It was the concept of through the site. It's adequately remove or you know in, into the site drive. Um, I don't want to yeah. get in, caught into the fact we everybody knows we don't have emergency vehicles on the two on the right and left side of the building. Right. So, so, Mr. Chairman, what, what I would suggest is that we change this to state the applicant shall ensure that emergency vehicles have access and egress through the site driveway. And then you would delete can adequately maneuver through the site. And I think the second sentence um, is it leaves us uh, fairly wide open. Um, well, that, that's a requirement anyways. I mean, yep. fire department access is is reviewed by the fire department before. They, but they've already reviewed the access. They review they review the application. But these are these are preliminary plans, so they're going to have to review the final plans and confirm that the access. Well, the building can't change size. The building can't change location. The building can't shift left or right. Um, the build that the the footprint well, of the building. Well, can't, can't again, they they've reviewed plans that are preliminary plans as part of this process. The, the requirement is that they review the final plan which have all of the the details yeah um, and, and that's a that's a state law requirement so that is a state law requirement. there's no there's no question that's a state law requirement but that statement um leaves leaves us to suggest that somehow there's another bite at the apple with regard to okay um, with regard to emergency access and we we, we can't have that okay matt if, if again if we go back to mr haverty's change you, you got to go back to that where you didn't complete the change. The applicant ensured that emergency vehicles will have driveway access. You have to delete, can adequately remove it through the site. That That's the phrase that's problematic that, that, that we're concerned about. It's that we're going to ensure that emergency vehicles have, uh, have access to the driveway uh, yeah. or whatever Mr. Yeah. Haverty. Through the site driveway. driveway. Mr. Haverty had the language. Yeah. Okay. So it is 709. Um, I actually do have to leave for another meeting. Mr. Haverty has to leave. The board has another meeting at 730. Um, we are probably 60% through this. We haven't had an opportunity for final public comment yet. This, can you just um, jump to one more so I'm, that's important? I'm I, I guess I just want to jump. Not to comfortable slamming this closed um, where we, and so I'm trying to, so I need to, you know, go back to the applicant here, um, you know, what's, what's our, what's our plan here? Do we need to have one more session to, to keep massaging the proposed conditions? 
I, you know, I, I, um, well, that's up to my client. Um, I'm not available until after May 15th, after today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think mean, I, only... I didn't know we were, I didn't know we were, li- we were living on time this evening. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 um, the only, the only, well, Matt, I leave it up to you. The only other one that I had, uh, the other word smithing, I'm quite confident. I'm not, I'm not as concerned about that. That's going to be problematic. The only other one is I too. Um, that's something that, uh, yeah. that, that we've been through with the CONCOM and, um, um, you know, there what was is, your final resolution with the CONCOM? Well, that they didn't, they haven't presented a bond amount. We've explained yeah. all the ways that uh, this this pro this the, the this project has been tied up with mm-hmm. regard to getting their work done and, and how problematic it is to have a bond with a with a condominium association. Um, and so, it's not a requirement of the local bylaw. It's a may. And mm-hmm. uh, we think all of the ways between the condominium documents, putting it in the budget, all the things that we've done during the public hearing process has, you know, a bond is just not appropriate. And it's very complicated with the condo. We would ask that, that be stricken. That those are... You, you, there's some wordsmithing comments, but we would we we were comfortable that I, I didn't have anything else, Matt. I don't know if you did. Um, I mean, not. I mean, I I'd love to be able to 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 uh, breeze through. Can we can we get five more minutes, Christian? Please. Um, Mr. Hanlon. We'd like to remind that this is a public hearing, and yeah. so once we finish with this, there we need to we have a total of about twenty more minutes that we can give the public to comment on this. So, you know, it, it's we either need we either need to give ourselves more time or we need to focus really hard. But I think that we can't possibly do this with giving the public less than fifteen minutes. And there, there's no, no way that the next hearing gets pushed off by ten minutes. I mean, we could. It's a continuation of this meeting, is it not? I mean, not closing this and starting another, or is it a completely separate meeting? It's a so completely a separate meeting. meeting. I mean, we can ask our, you know, we can have our administrator open the meeting and notify people that we're running late and we're going to, you know, that will be delayed in the start. Um, but we do want to, you know. I think we can, we I, if, if, if that's doable, um, I think we can get through the balance of it. I think, I think we've covered all the bases. Um, uh, but if we had, you know, five or ten more minutes, I, I, I think I can be more a lot more comfortable that we have. Okay. Um, Chairman, Colleen, are you comfortable with that plan? I'm going to have to leave for my other meeting. Yeah. Okay. But you can contact oh. me and let me know where you go from here. Christian, All I right. can't start the other meeting until I close this one. It won't let me. Oh. Oh, it won't. Okay. I didn't realize it would happen. I, I I don't Matt I don't know why don't you just look through your notes and point out any other changes I don't have any um, other than that they need to conform to the concom but we've been through that I, I don't know if you have any other comments you just want to give them the numbers and just let them know or we can extend out the hearing and we have another session give me if you could give me thirty seconds please yeah. Mr. Chairman, I do have to go, but I, I can let you know that if this does get continued, I am available next Wednesday or next Thursday. Okay. And also, I think you've got something already on for next Tuesday. We do. Which I'll be there for that. So if you wanted to stack it onto that hearing, I'm, I'm, yeah. be available then too. Oh, I okay. mean, my, 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 my client could do without me. I'm not going to be available until May 15th. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I think I'm okay. Okay. All right. So with that, we're going to say we have no additional comments. Um, so we will go ahead and open for public hearing. Um, I can see. Um, so I apologize to the public because there really isn't much time this evening um, remaining for public comment. Um, but we have had several opportunities, but I do want to make sure we open it up. So if you would like to address the board, please use uh, raise your hand using the button on, um, I believe it's the reactions tab now. Um, and you will be called upon, uh, asked to give your name and address and be asked to give your comments. So, so with that, um, we recognize Ms. Winnell Evans. There we go. Sorry. Winnell Evans, 20 Orchard Place, uh, uh, Precinct 14 Town Meeting Member. As you're going through this, I'm also following along. So forgive me if my questions are repetitive, but I just want to make sure I'm clear on a couple of things. Sure. On page 10, A6, uh, it indicates that the waiver from our noise bylaw has been approved, uh, allowing a seven to six workday on weekdays and an eight to five workday on Saturdays. However, I do not see this in the final list of waivers at the end of the document. So I just want to confirm that that has indeed been granted. Um, so that there, it has been requested, um, but the board won't make a final decision on waivers and everything until the very end. But there should be, there was earlier a waiver related to that. I'll make sure it gets back in. Okay, I, I would just like to- Okay, thank you for that. I would just like to register a comment. Given that this project um, may may take up 12 to 18 months, as um, Mr. Maggiore stated in a previous meeting, I, I think that's a pretty big ask. Uh, this is a busy street, but it is a residential street. And I, I think that's a big ask for the neighbors. So just, just for the record. Uh, my second comment is on page 16, item D2B the plan for um, property management, professional property management has been deleted and I'm wondering why that is. Um, what section is it? This is a D2. D2B. D2 uh, it's all been deleted. The applicant shall provide to the board evidence of a property management plan or a contract with a management company. And I'm wondering what provision has been made for property management in its stead. I know we had discussed this last time. There was a question about because it's not a rental property, it's not rental units, but mm -hmm. it's condominiums that it's a little bit different. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, homeowners the homeowners association, the homeowners association will typically in a 50 unit condominium engage a third party property manager because there are 50 units. But it again, we didn't want to. Um, you know, buying the homeowners association to a particular plan. It's just, it just, it, it's not a rental project was the point and, and, and that's why it was deleted. But okay. uh, I can assure you that every project of this scale that we've developed um, starts with a professional management company. And I believe all of them still have them. Uh, we just, as Paul stated, don't want to be, um, you know, pass off a requirement to an association that, right. um, that, um, wouldn't wouldn't uh, be appropriate uh, based on no. condo ownership. Understood. Okay. Ms. Evans? Okay. Thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, on page 17, item E1 uh, removes the uh, suggestion that there was going to be a neighborhood meeting that has been deleted. Um, if that is indeed the case, will this project um, Mr. Klein, you would probably be able to answer this. Will this project be required to distribute the so-called good neighbor agreement to all abutters within 200 feet uh, as required by our bylaws? I believe this would still be covered by, by the good neighbor agreement, yes. Okay, so we'll get that, but there will not be a neighborhood meeting, is that correct? Um, there, it hadn't come up during the hearings that there's a request for such a meeting. Okay. Um, 
but the is your sense that a meeting like that would be important or do you think that adherence with the good neighbor agreement would be sufficient you know it's it's so hard to tell people are people are so oblivious to what goes on in town <laughs> somebody wanted to know what's that big new building going up in front of the high school they didn't even realize it was the new high, school. The high school so i you know i don't know how people would i i think the gna would be very much appreciated though okay um okay and my mr. my chairman, final i'm sorry mr chairman i just just want to be make sure that everybody understands that the, what we're dealing with here is really an ask that mm -hmm. there are no decisions that have been made on any of these things. Right. Um, so, and it's it's entirely appropriate for Ms. for Ms. Evans to make asks too. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, and my final comment is, if there is a need for rodent control during construction, I would beg you to please not use second generation anticoagulant rodenticide boxes. Yeah. This is something that the town is working hard to get rid of. We have had um, deaths of raptors. There has been a lot of attention paid to this issue. Um, and I would, I would beg you to please look into using um, dry ice or other methods. I know that the Millbrook condominium used dry ice. They dug into the burrows. Um, and use this, and I believe it was fairly successful. So, so that would be a, a, a request um, to you if that becomes necessary during construction. It, it, I believe that's in that's in E thirty one E dot thirty one now. I missed that. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Sure. Um, and that that is it for my my request and my my comments. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the board this evening? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment for tonight's hearing. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, so where we are now. Um, just just one yes. response. I mean, I, I really appreciated the comments of Ms. Evans. Um, but if the, the concern is the length of time the project will go on and, you know, as projects go on, the length of time does become annoying to the neighbors. As Mr. Maggio already said at the last public hearing, um, starting construction at eight during the weekday or nine on the Saturdays, it's going to eliminate week, weekends because contractors don't want to start at nine and end for half a day. And uh, the, the entire most trades the entire commonwealth start at seven you eliminate that hour you're going to take a a 12 month project or a 13 month project and you're going to add weeks to it and there's a balance there i i, I take miss evans comments 100 percent, but the balance is let's get the construction done and get everybody out of there rather than have weeks more because of an hour in the morning so it's important to the contractor uh, that's why we raised it and we just want to point that out i know the board will deliberate on it but i wanted you to understand the reason is the contractor planning to work seven days or six six okay so if we were to grant the 7 a.m but remove sunday hours that would be acceptable i think that would be a fair trade-off thank you okay perfect we'll do that um so at this stage public comment is closed um are there any additional questions from the board or is there any information the board feels it is lacking in regards to this application? Seeing none. Um, so I think the board therefore is at the end of the public hearing process for this application. Um, the board has a considerable public record um, that has been built up as, as Mr. Feldman said over the last six months. Um, so at this time, I will move to close the public hearing for the residences at Millbrook to allow the board to proceed to deliberations on the final decision. Second. Second, Mr. Hanlon. So uh, just to clarify for the board, this is a, a vote to close the public hearing, we will no longer be accepting new information on this hearing, and the board will now move on to the deliberation section. We have 40 days to issue a written decision. Um, so with that, I will do a, a vote, a roll call vote of the board. Uh, 
Mr. DuPont? I see you mouthing I. Oh, hi. Oh, sorry. I. Mr. Hanlon? I. Um, Mr. Holly? I. Ms. Hoffman? I. Mr. LeBlanc? I. And the chair votes I, Mr. Riccadelli being absent. Um, so the public hearing for the residences at Millbrook is now closed. Um, the board will need to schedule uh, its next uh, meeting on this. From here out, the meetings of the board that relate to these, they are public meetings. Um, everyone is able to access them and watch them, but uh, the meetings will be closed to just the members of the board and, uh, and to Mr. Haverty as we um, compile the final decision. So we will, as soon as we have a schedule for that, we will post that um, up for everyone else. Um, so with that, our evening's uh, business for this hearing are complete. So uh, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington, I <laughs> should say this evening's meeting of the Arlington Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording is to ensure the creation of an accurate record. It's our understanding the recording will be available on ECMI. If anyone has uh, comments or questions, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. Um, and with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. The board is you know, is here. This is a vote to adjourn for four minutes and then return on the next hearing. Um, so with that vote of the board, Mr. Dupont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli is absent. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Uh, for everyone, that it is a di different call in number for the next Zoom meeting, um, which starts at 7 30. So, Mr. Chair. thanks everyone for your everybody. participation. Really appreciate it. Um, we'd like to, we'd like to thank everybody. Um, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a, a very cordial process. Um, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of evenings have been, um, taking up this project, and we'd like to thank everybody for their time and, uh, for for working with us and um, we're very excited to um, hear uh, your thoughts and deliberations in the coming uh, weeks and uh, again thank you for the opportunity and thanks to everybody for for your time on s several evenings over the last six months I thank you I, I second that thank you very much <laughs> thank you have a great evening cheers thank thank you. Good luck. Good luck. okay well, it is 7.34 p.m. It is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, first, I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, so members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Van Kelly. Here. Uh, Dana Riccadelli is not with us this evening. Um, Elaine Hoffman? Here. And Adam Moblank? Here. Good to have you all back. Um, on behalf of the town, we have our zoning assistant, Colleen Ralston. Good evening. Good evening. Long time no see. Um, Appearing on behalf of 15 Grandview Road, uh, Thomas and Jennifer Baxter. Hello. Here. Hello. With us, uh, appearing for 21 Oak Ledge Street, um, Anthony and Lydia Byers. Here. We're here. Good to have you. Uh, appearing on behalf of 106 Varnum Street, uh, Bob and Essie. Bob's name, Bob's name is up. Is there someone else who's here on behalf of 106? Bob and Essie is here, Chris. Okay. Oh, good. Thanks, Bob. Sorry about that. Um, and then appearing on behalf of 25 Teal Street, uh, Carolyn and Antish Salvi. Uh, they're not here, but I'm Rachel Gray. I'm here. And Rachel Gray. Carolyn Salvi will be here in a few. Okay, perfect. 
No, no problem at all. Okay, so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects. Signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all public all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, okay. so long as they provide adequate alternative access to public meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda and as chair or reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. <clears throat> Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So this evening we have um, no administrative items to take care of, so we're going to be moving on to the hearings. Uh, before the opening of the hearing, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce the agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves or mm -hmm. themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal and after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. So with that, the item on our agenda is item number two. It's docket 3744, 15 Grandview Road. Um, and actually, I apologize, it's docket 3743, uh, I believe is 15 Grandview Road. So with that, um, I would invite the applicants to introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Hi, my name is Jen Baxter and I'm here with my husband, Tom Baxter, and we have a proposal to add a covered front entryway to our house. Um, the purpose is for to improve curb appeal and it is sort of nearly identical to the um, covered entryway of a Cape two houses down from us on the same street. Wonderful. Um, I am and I'm sorry, I understand that you already have, you have all the materials from our contractor. We do. We okay. do. I'm just going to open that up. Let's see. Tonight, it's between grand view. Okay, so this is the that's the application. Okay. 
these are the existing conditions. Um, so the house is currently under renovation, but this is the, the front elevation. These are the steps currently leading towards uh, the street. And then this is the proposal here for three foot six by 10 foot seven covered porch with new framed steps, um, essentially the same position. Um, leading towards the street. Framing details. And here's just the, the site plan. Uh, so on the left, this is the existing condition where the steps and the landing are the same width, essentially it's the walk itself. And then here's the proposed condition with new steps um, and the three and a half foot by 10.6 foot covered porch. And I believe this is just the same sheet. Yep. Right. So, all right, so this is, uh, they're seeking relief through uh, section 539A and D, which is has to do with um, uh, porches and, that are in setbacks. Um, I, I had one question, but I believe in talking with a building inspector, um, it sort of worked out. One of the things that's gonna happen here uh, because of the imposition of the covered porch, um, one of the things we have in town is this provision of usable open space, which any space that's 25 by 25 can count towards usable open space. And this area in the front yard will is 25 by 25 and will now be smaller than that. But the usable open space provision also requires that the space be relatively flat, and this area being on the side of a hill is not flat. So the the area at the front does not count towards usable open space. So the uh, creation of this porch will not uh, affect the overall calculation of usable open space. So I just wanted to clarify that. Are there questions from the board? Mr. Chair? It's a little blank. Uh, just one question on, uh, I guess, what the proposed materials are of the the porch, just to kind of know what that plan is. They have that. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, is that for me to answer the? Yes, it's, please. Um, it's Azac um, for the uh, for the steps and the uh, posts and the flooring, um, and the roof. I assume is going to be the same shingles that are on the. That are on the main body of the house. So the idea is to kind of use complementary materials to what you have going on in the rest of the house. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the process of deciding the front of the house with hardy board, and so it'll it will look the same as the new siding. That's all I had. Okay. Thank you. Um, stop the share. I did want to try to find. Um, that's all I'm looking for. Here, so we have a memorandum. Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chair. No. Yes, Mr. Holly. Um, just a minor comment, maybe. Um, on the sheet, it says guardrail at three feet. Is that, um, it's just a typo, I suppose. Um, it's on sheet A2, A23 or? Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't actually have a copy of the proposal that the contractor submitted. So is that on the um is that on the plan or is that on the the that's on the second sheet of the it's on the plan uh detail one. Detail one. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. So how is it that the guardrail height is three feet? Was that the question? Yep. Yeah. Shouldn't it be 
because the fall is bigger. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to remember if the number is different in the commercial code and residential code, and I do not know off the top of my head. I don't recall off the top of my head either, but I believe they are different. Okay. That is, that is certainly something we can leave to the building inspector to, sure. um, to rectify. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Okay, so I am now going to be opening the meeting for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on, used to be the participants tab, but I think it is now officially the reactions tab. Um, and if you're calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair. You'll be asked to give your name and address for the record, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. And all questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has ended, the public comment period will be closed. Um, so we can easily give uh, 20 to 25 minutes for public comment should that be required. Uh, with that, the name on the list is uh, Daniel Peterson. So if you could name an address for the record and. Uh, hello, my name is Daniel Peterson, uh, 38 Teal Street in Arlington. Um, just a quick point of clarification. Am I am I correct in, in looking at this and thinking really the only issue is the front setback of a few feet? Is that right? Is there any other reason that it requires uh, board approval? Nope, that's absolutely correct. So the zoning bylaw requires um, a certain front yard setback. And if an enclosed or closed or covered porch is larger than a certain size, then it just requires a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals in order to be approved. Great, thanks. That's what I thought. I mean, I love the project. It looks historically appropriate and, you know, great curb appeal um, for the Baxters. Uh, yeah, definitely a plan. I won't take any more time. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Are there other members of the public who wish to address this issue? Going once, going twice. I will go ahead and close the public comment period uh, for uh, 15 Grandview Road. And I'm going to go ahead and share. This is the um, memorandum prepared by the Department of Planning and Community Development on the. Um, so the applicants are seeking a covered porch for their single family home, approximately 37 square feet, which exceeds the maximum 25. Um, and the purpose of the project to improve convenience and safety. It's in the R1 zoning district. Proposed porch projects forward 3.5 feet from the front facade. New stair, an additional four feet, decreasing the front yard setback. And the following of the special permit criteria by section 333, which we need to find. Um, the first is that the requested use is permitted in the R1 zoning district, the first the single family home. Uh, criterion two, public convenience and welfare. Proposal would improve the convenience, safety, and appearance of the owner's entrance to their home. Uh, criterion three, there will not be an increase in traffic congestion or an impairment of public safety. Criteria four, there would not be an undue burden on any municipal systems. Criterion five, the proposal will not result in the need for any special regulation uh, apart from the uh, Section uh, 539, which they have requested in their application. Uh, criteria six, the integrity and character. While the proposed front porch exceeds the maximum square footage allowable by right, covered or enclosed porches and porticos are a common feature in the surrounding neighborhood, including on Grandview Road. 
consistent with the residential design guidelines, the proposed design will introduce human scale architectural variation to the overall streetscape and add visual interest to the front facade of the structure. Overall, this proposal would not detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district or adjoining districts, nor will it be detrimental to the health, morals, or welfare of the neighbors of the property. And criteria number seven, this proposal will not cause any detrimental excess of, a, of the use. Um, this also includes a photograph of uh, the property, which is here. And there should be, yeah, a uh, view from the street. So as you can see, these are the, the steps. Uh, these will be taken off. It would be a slightly deeper, slightly wider um, porch. And um, that's just a more straight on view. And then the, the summary from the Department of Planning and Community Development, they maintain that this proposal is consistent with the special permit criteria uh, in 333. And then they reference some additional uh, dockets that have been similar. Go ahead and stop share on that. Are there any further questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chairman. Um, which, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, just a comment. I, I'm, I'm fully in support of, of the application. It seems to me that this is pretty much as plain vanilla as this kind of an application can be. The amount of space that's involved here is small. The, the kind of project that we're talking about is common uh, in the neighborhood and as both the planning department uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Peterson uh, pointed out, it's it's carried out in, a, in an effective way that that uh, will only improve the the uh, curb appeal of the applicant and the uh, and the overall attractiveness of the community. The only thing that is a potential would have been a potential issue would have been an aggravation of uh, us usable open space deficiency. But uh, since it doesn't count. Uh, this area would not have counted to usable open space anyway. It will not make it will not make anything worse in that regard. So I'm going to be in support of this. Thank you, Mr. Han. Uh, should the vo board vote to approve, there are three standard conditions that the board would impose, uh, which I'll read into the record. The first, number one, is the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. Should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two, the building inspector is hereby notified that it is to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time they determine that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And condition number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Um, I would ask the board if there are any additional um, conditions they think are necessary. Um, I know Mr. Holly raised the question about the height of the guardrail. Um, that's certainly something that the building inspector has jurisdiction over. And so it's not incumbent upon us to remind the, the inspection services to review that. Um, are there any other conditions that members of the board think would be appropriate in this regard? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. DuPont. So are we still including for these the reference to the fact that this does not create the uh, lot line, the foundation, or is that something that's been addressed with the bylaw itself? Remember, we would say that I forget yeah. exactly what the wording was. I'm just going to quickly flip to that page in the bylaw just to make sure. So provision D now is, um, so 539D says porches, decks, steps, and landings in the required setback are not considered to be within the foundation wall and may not be enclosed, extended, or built upon except by special permit. 
All right. Um, so that, and that was added at town meeting last year specifically for this purpose. It's a little bit less direct than I was thinking, but I, I think that that covers it. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Anything further from the board? If not, I will take a motion in regards to this application. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I move that the board approve this application subject to the three standard conditions that the chair has just read into the record. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second to Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board in favor of the special permit request for 15 Grandview Road with the three stated conditions. Uh, roll call vote of the voting members of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Uh, Mr. Holly? Aye. And in the absence of Mr. Riccadelli, um, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, the special permit is approved. Thank you very much for coming before us this evening. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your help. We appreciate it. Absolutely. That brings us to item three on our docket this evening, uh, docket number 374421 Oak Ledge Street. Um, <clears throat> I could ask the applicants to introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. I'm Anthony Byers. And I'm Lila Byers. So we are um, looking to add an additional um, bedroom to our house, but given the very non-conforming nature of our lot, um, we are seeking uh, a variance um, to do that. Okay. Pull up the documents. Okay. Um, so I will, I, yeah. I know the applicants have requested a variance. Um, the for a very specific reason, the notice uh, says a special permit, and um, I'll explain that in a second here. Um, so we'll know that the the buyers has uh, appeared before the zoning board of appeals uh, a few years back uh, for a variance request. Uh, to add what is um, currently the within the, the bound of the red dash line, uh, right. which is a, a first floor bathroom yes. uh, with a landing and a, and stairs. And at that time, the board granted them a variance um, mm -hmm. for this. And this is constructed and this is in place today. Uh, right. So what they are so what they are now requesting is they would like to build on top of it, which includes, uh, because a bedroom needs to be at least seven feet wide, uh, they are requesting what amounts to a second story addition that is wider than the first floor, which is going to further reduce the side yard setback. Right. Um, and subsequent to the last time you were before us, um, the interpretation of the of the state zoning laws have been amended or changed and if there is a, a, an existing non-conformity, which in this case you have, because it's only uh, uh, 6.7 feet to that. Correct. Mm -hmm. yep. 8.7 feet. Yep. Um, because you already have a, an existing non-condition, um, a further a furtherance of that non of that non-conformity can be approved by special permit. Yep. Um, so you do not need a variance for it. Um, it's basically what it means is just that the requirements are, are much, le much less stringent uh, than they would be otherwise. Uh, but it does not differ in any other way, shape, or form. Um, so the the blue dash line is, I believe, correct. The requested requested new outline. Yes. Um, yes. So looking from the rear, it's this portion here. I'm looking from the front, look at this portion here. Yeah. 
So this is the this is the porch down below. Um, mm -hmm. Is is the back? Is this portion um, currently unroofed at the back? Correct. Yes, okay. there is no roof. It is. Okay. Yeah. And so this is the second floor proposal. And then on the first floor, will there just will there be a column dropped in? Yes. For this outer yes. corner. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The view from the street. Close up of the first floor uh, addition. So this roof will come off. It'll extend out pretty much to the edge of the eave and then come up. Yes. And then from the rear. Mm -hmm. There are some examples of some similar type of additions here in Arlington. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Are there questions from the board? Seeing none. Um, We'll go ahead and open the meeting for public questions and comments. Um, as stated before, uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask their questions and make comments. Uh, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. And if you're calling in by phone, you may dial star nine. You'll be identified by the uh, by the chair and asked to give your questions and comments. So with that, the public hearing portion of this meeting is public comment period is open. Are there any members of the public who wish to address this application at 21 Oak Ledge Street? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing at 21 Oak Ledge Street. Um, so there, are, uh, the request that's being made is pretty straightforward. Um, so the where this where this really comes down to it's uh, in the zoning bylaw section uh, 811A and 813B which have to do with pre-existing non-conforming conditions. Um, so the board, which is essentially uh, falls under uh, section six of the state statute under 40A. Uh, so an extension or alteration of an existing structure or use shall not be substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conforming structure or use to the neighborhood. So that's what the board would need to find. Um, and the board would also need to find that an increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, and the board typically applies the special permit uh, criteria under section 333 to assist in the in making that determination. Um, I just want to check. I don't recall if we have received a... Um, a memorandum from the Department of Planning and Community Development on this. Do not see one. Check this location. Oh, there it is. Because you're seeking a special permit in accordance with section 813. Um, applicant seek to construct an additional bedroom in the second story of a single family home, existing structure in R1 zoning district, non conforming with the bylaws lot size, frontage, front, left, right, side yards, and usable open space. 
Zoning Board of Appeals previously granted a variance for the construction of a one-story addition to the left side yard. The proposal would add a second story to the side addition and create a roof overhang. As a result, the building footprint would be extended into the required side yard setback by an additional foot. The rear yard setback would be slightly reduced from 15.7 to 15.0. Uh, um, the addition would not increase any of the other nonconformities of the existing structure. Uh, and in their review of the special permit criteria, uh, criteria number one, the requested use is permitted through a special permit in the R1 zoning district. Uh, criterion two, on public convenience and welfare, this proposal would provide additional living space for a family. Criteria three, there will not be an increase in traffic congestion or an impairment of public safety. Criteria number four, there would not be an undue burden on municipal systems. Criteria number five, this proposal would not result in the need for special regulations. Um, criteria number six, uh, regarding the integrity character of the district, this proposal would add a second story to a side addition with a roof overhang into the left side yard due to existing topography, lot conditions, orientation of the structure. There are limited opportunities to expand the existing structure in conformance with the zoning bylaw. The ZBA stated in a variance decision dated October 6, 2020, that it would be a substantial hardship to expand the building footprint without intruding at least a small way into the left side yard. Homes in the vicinity of the property are primarily two-family colonial and old-style homes. While site additions are not a common feature in this neighborhood, the proposal to add a second story above an existing addition does not interrupt the existing streetscape pattern. Consistent with the residential zoning by design guidelines, the addition is designed to complement the scale and style of the existing colonial bungalow-style home and adjacent homes in the neighborhood. Overall, this proposal would not detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district or adjoining districts, nor will it be detrimental to the health, moral, and welfare of the neighbors of the property. And criteria six, there will not be any detrimental excess. Um, so this is the, the property here. Um, and similar, these are the uh, photos from the front and a photo from the front corner. And in their summary, Department of Planning and Community Development maintain that this proposal is consistent with special permit criteria in section 333A through G of the zoning bylaw. Um, it, uh, are there any additional questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I'm a little bit, I'm not entirely comfortable with the notion that this is a special permit rather than a, more appropriately an amendment of the earlier variance. Uh, it is somewhat odd that that you go through all of the requirements that the state does in order to uh, get one thing and then you can extend it without doing anything more than a section six notice. Um, but it it's not necessarily inconsistent with the bylaw and I suppose you have to decide this thing one way or another, and it is in some ways as a matter of policy more appropriate to use the framework that 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 we're using here. Uh, but I do want to note that it doesn't seem to me to be completely obvious that uh, non-conforming structures is the is the right framework for for dealing with this. Um, in any event, it seems to me that no matter what structure you used, uh, you would come to the same result here. It seems appropriate to the the amount of additional intrusion into the into the side yard is uh, 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 small, and uh, it's and the many of the basics of the original of the original uh, uh, the original uh, uh, variance would carry over. So. I'm not sure it makes a big difference, and in some ways, I prefer the way in which the uh, board is going about doing this. But I do want to say that I don't think it's it's entirely obvious that that's the right way to do it, and uh, and I go with go with that with a slight amount of discomfort. But it, in generally, I think it's the right outcome. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this was this was the direction that special services recommended we proceed. That's all I can say in that regard. Um, are there other questions or comments? The only thing I had wanted to go back to, um, so this is the certified uh, plot plan that was provided by the applicant. 
Um, the special permit does need to be registered with the Registry of Deeds. Um, and I, you will need, I, I'm fairly confident to have a an updated plan showing the current condition and, and the proposed condition for this project as opposed to for the previous project. So I just bring that to your attention that I, that, that will be uh, most likely a requirement in order to file this with the registry. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and then that will include the final setbacks as was stated in the uh, the documentation from uh, the planning department. Um, the site plan doesn't have what the what the revised number uh, setbacks are, and that will be included on that as well. So, all right, we'll get that um, done. Thanks. Okay. So with that, uh, the board should the board uh, decide to vote on this matter. Uh, there are the three standard conditions that would apply. Uh, those were read in, into the record on the prior hearing, so I will go ahead and waive that for now. Um, are there any additional conditions that the board feels would be necessary um, on this application at 21 Oak Ledge? Seeing none, I would ask for a, a motion on this application. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'm moved that the application uh, for a special permit be approved uh, subject to the standard conditions that the chair previously read into the record. Uh, in doing that, it implies also making all of the findings that are required uh, under state, under MGL uh, section 40, uh, section six and ch chapter 40, section six, uh, which uh, I think have had been adequately addressed by the uh, staff report. Second. Thank you. So this is the vote of the board to approve the special permit request for 21 Oakland Street with the standard three conditions um, and also uh, in compliance with section 40, uh, with, excuse me, chapter 40A, section six. Um, so with that, a vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. In the absence of Mr. Riccardelli, uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The special permit for 21 Oak Ledge is approved. Okay. Well, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. For... Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Take care. Thank Bye. you. So this brings us to the next item on our agenda. This is docket 3745. Which is 106 Varnum. Up. Oh, okay, so I have this alternately listed as docket 3745 and 3742. Um, but I believe 3745 is the correct number. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, to the extent that it matters, the docket number that is listed in the legal notice, which I had assumed would be the official one, is ah. is 42. Is 42? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so either way, it is 106 Barnum Street. Um, I will ask uh, Mr. Anessi, I believe, is the um, attorney for the applicant uh, to introduce uh, the request. Mr. Anessi? There anyone else here speaking in favor of, in uh, behalf of 106 Farnham Street? Hi, uh, my name is Alex Gueller. 
I'm the uh, pro project manager and uh, the son of the owner, David Giller, who's also uh, available to speak this evening. Um, we are here seeking a special permit in order to add parking uh, to the rear of our property. Uh, our current project is adding uh, or converting a two family unit to two condos. What currently exists is uh, an eight point uh, five to 8.7. So basically the bare minimum width of a driveway um, that requires everyone to park in tandem. And what we are trying to achieve uh, is putting three parking spots in the back um, with an area to allow them to properly maneuver so that they can pull straight in and straight out um, in order to not have to have such a tight area as well as having um ease of use uh, to the driveway instead of having to shuffle cars. Um, prior use for this building was a rental property. There would be uh, four to five cars that would be stacked up in that driveway. Um, and it would be a constant shuffle. Um, feedback that we've gotten from tenants in the past is in order to get one out, you know, everybody has to move. So uh, we're trying to address that. We're trying to improve the current situation that's on the property. And we are here seeking the special permit in order to execute this plan. Okay. Um to the ah, Mr. Nessie is there. Good to see you. Um, Mr. Nessie, you're on. You're still on mute. And I'm also here. I'm David Giller. Okay. I've unmuted you three times, Bob. All right. They're doing. Here we go. Hey, can you hear me, Chris? We can, sir. Okay. Uh, I, I was a good, that was a good presentation that we heard just a few minutes ago. Uh, essentially, I think we all understand that parking uh, is a problem in, in, uh, in the town of Arlington. Uh, you have no overnight parking on any of the public ways. Uh, uh, indeed, even during the day, uh, there's a problem uh, with uh, parking. Now, this property happens to be very close to Magnolia Park. Uh, people who go to Magnolia Park uh, uh, certainly would like to have a, uh, a place to park their vehicles uh, during the day when they use the park with their children. Uh, and uh, what we are proposing uh, is that we would get our cars off the street. And, and by the way, I, I heard that uh, sometimes there are cars stacked up in the driveway. Well, if you look at the plan, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, part of my submission, uh, you, you will see that the driveway itself is very, very narrow. Uh, and uh, the only way that you can get cars uh, in that uh, driveway uh, would be to have tandem parking. Uh, we all know also that tandem parking is not the best approach uh, in the town with respect to having cars back out onto a public way. What we are trying to do with our property is get the cars out of the driveway so we don't have tandem parking, we don't have cars backing out onto the public way, and get them into the backyard. Now, one of the issues that uh, we have is that, uh, uh, that of open space. Uh, the, there's very limited open space Presently on the property, uh, it's like 1,097 uh, square feet. Uh, uh, 1, 000, yeah, 1,097 square feet. If we uh, are able to achieve what we're trying to achieve, there will be no open space, essentially, on the property. Now, we can argue that there would be open space uh, because uh, you'd have a certain open space on the lot itself. You'd have open space... Uh, you got my memo, I believe, I hope, that I submitted to the uh, board uh, yesterday. Uh, and uh, one of the points I made was that you certainly have open space. You don't have continuous 25 feet of open space, but you have open space on the open porches and you have open space uh, on the lot itself. Uh, what we need is if we're going to be able to achieve what we're trying to achieve, we would need relief with respect to open space. We would also need relief with respect to 
parking in a residential area. We would also need relief with respect to location of uh, parking uh, on the lot. Now, uh, why do I think that this is a good uh, suggestion for the property and for the town? Uh, I believe it is because again, it frees up parking spaces on Varnum Street. Uh, and it, it brings about a situation where it's an aid to people who will be using Magnolia Park. Uh, what it does for my client is it uh, brings up a, a, about a benefit to them because they no longer have tandem parking and they're not uh, bothered with having to back out onto Varnum Street. Now, when the clients came in to see me, I, I must tell you, I said to them, uh, the, you know, this is a challenge, okay? Uh, the, you know, this is not the uh, everyday situation that, that gets approved in two seconds by a zoning board. Uh, one of the uh, points I, that I discussed with them uh, was, are there any other properties uh, in the neighborhood of your property that have a similar situation where they have uh, parking in their backyard? And there are, uh, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, there are uh, a number of other, uh, other properties that have parking in the backyard. Uh, so they got their cars off Bonham Street. I'm suggesting to the members of the board that there be no adverse impact uh, on the neighborhood uh, if, in fact, my clients were given relief uh, with respect to uh, the parking issue. Uh, uh, indeed, there'd be a benefit to the town and there'd certainly be a benefit to them as well. Uh, the One of the points I did uh, make as well in my memo was, uh, with respect to open space, at least the image of open space, uh, you've got Magnolia Park with all of that open space. So you're not creating a situation where you're massing uh, property here. Uh, what you're doing is, you're getting cars off of a public way onto the property itself. And I believe that it's beneficial for all. So I, I would uh, uh, buttress uh, what my client just said. And uh, I would be asking that the board uh, grant relief so that we can have parking in the backyard as shown on the plan uh, that I've submitted or the plans I've submitted to the zoning board. Uh, and uh, that's my request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nessie. Um, so just to clarify, is the property currently conforming with the usable open space? No. Why do you say it is not conforming with usable open space? Alex Savisky, are you on? Alex? Uh, I do not believe Alex is on right now. I tried calling him, uh, yeah, but he's okay. not with right. us. Uh, well, we did not believe it was, at least the architect, did not believe that it was uh, uh, conforming to open space, uh, Chris. Okay, because the listed gross floor area of the house in the application um, is 3,511 square feet. Yeah. And if the usable open space, as you had said, was 1,097 square feet. Correct. And that is 30% of 3,657, which is larger than the size of the house. So it appears that the house is currently compliant with usable open space. And so this would be a request for a new nonconformity, which would require a variance and not a special permit. Yeah. And so that we we are increasing the nonconformity. That's what you're saying. What we're saying we're is that we, from the documentation we have, there is no nonconformity with usable open space. And this, by adding parking to the rear, you are creating a new nonconformity, and therefore that requires a variance and not a special permit. Well, we we don't have the criteria. To, uh, and you would not meet the criteria for a special, for a variance. For a variance. We do not have that. And uh, I would not even try to do that. 
That would be an mm -hmm. exercise in futility. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping there's another way we can approach this, okay, mm -hmm. uh, with respect to, again, achieving a good result for everybody, not only the property owner, uh, but uh, the town and the people who use Magnolia Park by freeing up parking spaces on Varnum Street. Uh, now, if you're telling me that, no, we're not going to be able to get anywhere because you need to uh, go for a variance, I'm telling you that I would not be able to get it. Yeah. I'm um, honest. I'm, I'm honest with you about that. Yeah. No, I, I mean, that would, that would be our, you know, okay. the very, you know, as you know, very well, the first variance criteria is there has to be something unique about this parcel. That's not general exactly. to the district. And there is nothing unique about this, this rectangular parcel on flat land. No um, question. About it. Yeah. Is there another way we can approach this? If, uh, that. That's one of the things that I mentioned to my clients when they first uh, came in to see me as well. I said, look, we may wind up brainstorming this mm -hmm. with members of the zoning board to see if there's some way we can achieve this. Uh, it's a challenge, okay? Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I, I ordinarily don't come before the board uh, with a situation where I say to the board, I took the case on, and I told the clients it would be a challenge. Yeah. Uh, I would, I am unaware of any other way to proceed. Um, I would ask Mr. Hanlon or other members of the board if they have any different opinions on, on this, but it seems very straightforward that if you're trying to create a new nonconformity, that's a variance. Uh, Mr. It, I'm sorry, Mr. Hanlon? No, I will just, if you look at the drawing, which I gather with the area calculations, it seems pretty clear to me, at least, that if you, the parking area is what makes it conform now, uh, the area that would be changed into parking. And I don't see any uh, place else uh, in which uh, uh, you you can actually conform. So. It, it does seem to me that that the chair's analysis is is quite right. the The only thing that I could see would be is, is if you could show that you were a non you were non conforming now, so that this would be the extension of a of an open space deficiency. Conceivably, we could treat this as a uh, uh, non conforming use case. But if you're starting to conform, if you conform now and you and you uh, are introducing a new non conformity, I don't see how you can avoid applying for variance. We're certainly non-conforming with respect to every uh, almost every other aspect of the lot, right. <laughs> the lot size, the frontage, everything else. Okay, but uh, as Chris has done his calculations, and I accept them, Chris. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, you know we we do comply presently with open space, and uh, again, the, I can't get around that by applying for a variance. I just can't do it, Mr. Giller. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ted. No, I'm, sorry, I'm just, Mr. Gillard, I apologize. <laughs> that's okay. I'm having a problem with my camera, but I am here. Um, if I may, so the reason why we are here tonight in order to apply for the special permit is under direction from Mike Champo when asked directly um, after the result of a conservation commission meeting he said the proposed parking in the rear yard would create a new nonconformity and could only be allowed by special permit approval by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So although I'm, I'm not questioning um, the statement that you've made, because clearly you are more well versed in this than, than I am, um, we are here directly under the direction of, of Mike Champa. So okay. that's, I guess, why we're kind of confused at this point, because we told us that by inspectional services that this is the direction that we need to take and which is why we are here today because otherwise I mean I, I agree with with Bob and Nessie and I agree with your comment I mean to go to get a variance I mean that's just uh, a waste of everybody's time so that's why we did try and go this route you right. know a, as it was recommended by inspectional services okay uh, Mr. and I'm Chair. happy to forward that as well 
uh, just wanted to add, um, and I apologize if this is not the right time or place to bring it up, but there is a warrant article to mm -hmm. strike um, usable open space. I'm not sure where that stands in terms of um, how people feel about it, but it is something that is on the the warrant for the town for the town meeting that's ongoing right now. It has not been heard yet. What is that designed to do, Chris? Is that <laughs> Um, actually, if I may, um, could I ask uh, Mr. Fleming, who's on the call, to as, as a <laughs> proponent of that article? <laughs> sure, uh, just uh, James Fleming, um, Oxford Street. So the the provision is designed to remove this requirement in its entirety for one and two family um, uh, homes in all districts in town. Um, and it's actually this case is a perfect example of why I'm filing the article. So forget the parking for a second. If this house is indeed just barely conforming with usable open space, that means it literally can do nothing. You can't add any dormers at all without creating a nonconformity. This is a case I hadn't thought of. You can't uh, reconfigure your parking without uh, creating a problem. So th this is this is why I had filed the article. Is that I suspected these cases were out there, and you've you've handed one to me. Thank you. Um, if this article passes, this <laughs> would you would not be, you would not be running into this requirement at all. Uh, I think under those circumstances, <clears throat> I might want to see what happens at town meeting uh, yep. with respect to that warrant article. Uh, and uh, if, in fact, the sense on the part of the uh, members of the uh, zoning board is to vote on this uh, this evening, and I am not going to get a favorable vote, then I think I would be asking, uh, I subject to my client's uh, permission, uh, that uh, this matter be uh, uh, either continued or withdrawn without prejudice, okay? Uh, I, I think I'd rather not have it withdrawn without preju prejudice. I think I'd rather have it continued to see what happens with that Warren article. If that okay. Warren article uh, 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 gains the pleasure of the town meeting members, that could well uh, help my, uh, my situation. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Hanlon. Um, just to add one little, given what the testimony that we've already heard, um, if Mr. Champa, in fact, suggested that a special permit would be appropriate in this situation, uh, I would like to have Mr. Champa uh, provide us an explanation for what his thinking is, uh, rather than jumping mm -hmm. to the conclusion that he may have misspoken. Uh, and, so I think that some continuance is is in order, no matter what. Uh, whether a continuance is in order in order to keep this on the docket, uh, so that maybe town meeting might change the bylaw, and maybe in three or four months the attorney general will approve that, and then it'll be retroactive to the vote of the town meeting, uh, is something that that I would hesitate uh, to do, uh, but the applicant does have the option of withdrawing without prejudice and uh, and refiling if uh, if it turns out that the law changes in the applicant's favor. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, not that we would be continuing immediately, but the next date um, on our calendar would be May 23rd. So you're aware of what the our time frame is. Um, there's something lurking in the recesses of my brain, uh, Mr. Hanlon, about a withdrawal without prejudice uh, that uh, may be a problem uh, with respect to uh, my situation. Uh, and and uh, quite frankly, I can't put my finger on it right now, but it came up in one of my cases uh, about a year ago and uh, one uh, before the ARB, actually. And one of the members of the ARB raised the issue of, well, uh, you're not allowed to withdraw without prejudice. Uh, if you're going to withdraw, then it's going to be with prejudice. Now, again, uh, it eludes it, me right now in terms of uh, what the thinking was behind that. But I, I would not want to see a situation develop where uh, I request that that happen, a withdrawal without prejudice, 
and then find out that I'm behind the eight ball and I can't do anything with it at that point. <clears throat> Wondering if uh, it might make sense. Uh, and I'm not talking about June, Mr. Hanlon. I'm wondering if it might make sense to give us a reasonable continuance uh, so that we can perhaps see what happens at town meeting. If in fact, the article is voted on favorably at town meeting, then I think that's a different situation uh, that's presented for the members of the board uh, and myself uh, representing my clients as well. So I, I think I'd be asking uh, for a reasonable continuance rather than a withdrawal uh, without prejudice, since again, I have a concern that a withdrawal without prejudice may not, may not really be what it means. Mr. Chairman? Uh, this is David Giller. Yeah, um, I, I I would actually um, I, I hear what Mr. Anessi is saying, but but I'd also like to get a clarification from Mr. Champa because all along Mr. Champa has told us, as my son has indicated, that the special permit was the avenue for us to pursue, and now we're being told that that's not a possibility. So mm -hmm. I, I'd like a short continuance so that we can get a clarification from Mike Champa um, as to whether we went in the right direction. Um, he's the one that gave us the guidance. Right. No, and I, <clears throat> I would certainly be um, amenable to a request to continue to May 23rd. Um, That would because that would be our next regularly our next regular hearing. Um if that's not too far out for you guys. That's fine for us. That's good. Okay. Um before the vote uh, the board considers the continuance, um, we do have a fair number of people in attendance. And I know that this case is uh has a, a bunch of people who are interested in speaking on it. So I I would like to continue on to uh, public comment on this. Um, I think it will be valuable for uh, for the board and for the applicants. Um, so with that in mind, um, I would like to open the meeting for public comment. Public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the uh, reactions tab. Um, if you're calling in by phone, you may dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair asked to give your name and address for the record and given time for your questions and comments. Um, and once all public questions or comments have been addressed or um, we've reached the hour of nine o'clock, um, the public comment period will be closed. So with that, um, the first hand I see raised is uh, Daniel Peterson. I think I incorrectly, my name is Diane Shulbert. I don't know whether I, I am seeming to have Uh, Ms. Torbert, I'll come back to you, uh, okay. but I did want to go to Mr. Peterson. All right. So really crucial issue before us here. Um, uh, sorry, I have to ask you name and address of the record again. Sorry. Daniel Peterson, 38 Teal Street in Arlington, um, close to Magnolia Park. And so I have great respect for this project on, on certainly on both sides with I mean, setbacks are impossible in East Arlington, as everyone knows who lives here. You're pretty much in violation from the existing footprint. So I think to the, the point before town meeting, in order to be able to enact changes in many flat, tiny squares, um, it's going to require a special variance, which is impossible or consideration from the Board of Appeals. And so I mean, this is an important matter. Um, I would like some clarification from the board about how much precedent there is. I don't have great history in this town, you know, 
I'm a bit of a newbie myself on Teal Street. So, um, you know, I, it, the, the parking is impossible to the attorney's perspective. We know that to be true. You know, we're part of like letting tenants know that you can't park on the street. I mean, there's a lot of many ways that this could potentially be resolved. I think the attorney makes a great point that we don't want people bar backing out recklessly in front of Magnolia Park. Um, less convinced about how much traffic is re alleviated on the street, but could you guys, could you talk a little bit about how big of a precedent this sets? And I mean, it seems to me that maybe it would be good to just go in line and see what the vote says and, and, and revisit in a month or two. But curious for like a little more perspective. Thank you. Sure. Um, so as far as applications that have come before us for rear yard parking, um, this is the first I have seen where there wasn't already some form of of parking already in the rear. There was a project on Summer Street that had some existing rear yard parking that they were looking to reconfigure. Um, I've Seen parking where it's essentially you no know, bringing up. It, it it comes down to this whole question of usable open space. If in cases where there has where there is no usable open space, it does give the board more um, more discretion in how to act than if if the property is complying with usable open space. Um, in some ways, that's sort of an arbitrary distinction. Um, in, that in makes sense. Case, yeah. You know, no, I appreciate so that. I mean, we. Don't, I. I'm just sort of like I don't want to open a can of worms where everyone can build parking structures, but at the same time, I want lots to make sense and public areas to make sense. Yeah. And so I would be. I understand that there's a bit of an issue here where the technicalities, as Mr. Patton has laid out and you have laid out, Mr. Klein this is not the appropriate venue on the technicality of the variance. We've also heard from Mike Champa, the building inspector by proxy, that that's a non-starter and this is the only way to possibly achieve a win-win for the property owners and tenants and the town at large who uses the park. And so I'm definitely all about those solutions as long as it's a kind of a case by case basis, is it, you know what I mean? Is it safe to mm -hmm. say that, like, I would like to place my trust in you guys that this on its face seems appropriate to me, but at the same time, I wouldn't want to give carte blanche to have underground, above ground, backyard parking and no open space. That said, it does seem to make sense that if you you should be allowed to use your open space for parking if it's enclosed within setbacks on your property. So I guess I guess I'm maybe also asking for a continuance. I don't know. I mean, informative here. Um, I think this is an issue that's going to come up a lot, though, right? In terms of the redevelopment of the space and limited lot sizes, and trying to figure out parking and housing until the town changes overnight parking. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, next on the list um, is uh, Tanya Hughes. Hi there, uh, Tanya Hughes, 87 Varnum Street. I was wondering, is it possible to let Diane Torbert go first? She was trying to raise her oh, hand. Sure. I was. Okay. Um, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Diane Torbert. Hi, my name is Diane Torbert. I reside at 110 Barnum Street and I'm the owner of 110, 112 Barnum Street. I think one of the issues that has not been brought to the forefront here is that uh, I'm a direct abutter and these properties are located in a flood zone with a very high water table prone to flooding. I would direct the board to the written comments that I submitted as well as the photographs. Uh, which causes me grave concern about actually having the green space totally removed in addition to a tree with permeable pavers um, in this flooded area. I'm not, it's not been my experience in the 30 plus years that I've lived here that people that frequent Magnolia Field, Park on Barnum Street, 
They generally park in the parking area by Thorndike or directly across from the playground. Um, I am not a lawyer, um, but my understanding is that this is a, would be a new project and that there would need to be a setback from my property. We are routinely flooded in this area. Both 106, 108 and 110, 112 are sloped by the storm drain. There's a pumping station in Magnolia Field. Um, FEMA has visited our properties uh, due to flooding. And um, I can only see this creating more problems in that arena. Would you like me to display your letter and photos? Sure. Um, the letter. Um, is this that's your? From my, that's from my second floor. In And when was this? Uh, I think there's, there's two years. There's one that's 2010. That's actually when FEMA came. And the other's uh, picture I um, submitted was from 2019. That's my backyard. That's my driveway. One hundred six, one hundred eight is to the left. This is the pump that I use to not lose uh, all my furnaces and hot water heaters in my basement. That's the final photo. I mean, I'm I'm also concerned about the contamination if these cars are parked there with the uh, gas and the the vehicle fluids and the oil. Um, this. You know, I'm also concerned about the maintenance of the permeable pavers. I'm also concerned about the snow removal. I do not want snow plowed up against my property, increasing the flooding in my yard and basement. So I just request respectfully that that be taken into consideration. This is not, and we are not, we are sloped. We are not level with Magnolia Field. So and you say you're, you're lower than Magnolia Field. Yes. And okay. I'm not aware of the properties that Mr. Anisi was referring to, but to my right, all the way down to Thorndike and to my left, up to a house that I believe has a high fence. I don't know what's behind it. Um, I do not see any yards that have permeable pavers or parking in the backyard removed. Because this essentially would be removing the entire backyard. Yeah. Thank you very I, much. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, then I'll turn to Ms. Hughes. Hi there, Tanya Hughes, 87 Varnum Street. Um, I uh, should do an okay job with this, but I've been scribbling things and I can't always read my own handwriting. Um, I started out with three comments, but I got another one during um, while listening to everybody. Mm -hmm. So my first comment is that um, paving the backyard, uh, the petition says that it's desirable to public convenience and also that it will enhance the character of the neighborhood because it will mean that cars for that that um, property won't be parked on the street. But I think that's actually um, a little bit of a specious argument because um, my experience as a long-term resident of this neighborhood is that people regularly pull their cars out of their driveways and park them on the street, even when they have sufficient parking and even when they aren't using tandem parking because it's much more convenient and practical to do so if you're coming and going throughout the day. Um, also, people like to, you know, mark their territory by putting their cars in front of their house. Um, so I don't think that that the addition of three parking spaces is going to either alleviate or prevent any parking burden or hazards to pedestrians. Um, uh, I think at best, it's kind of a neutral change. Um, the second comment I have is that, and this is just 
probably slightly nitpicky, but the petition itself lists one parking space on the property. But um, we've heard from a couple of people here tonight that the current driveway fits four to five cars. So the addition of three spaces behind the house is going to result in seven to eight parking spaces, not three. So that's just a little nitpick. Um, <laughs> I feel like they have sufficient parking and I know tandem parking is a pain in the butt. I do know that. Um, uh, then my third comment is that I have concerns about the long-term viability of the permeable pavers because they require maintenance to keep them unclogged. Um, there's no guarantee that the pavers will be maintained and um, driving on the pavers itself will compact the subsurface. So even if it's appropriately constructed, the ability to drain will decrease year by year, having adverse effects on the immediate abutters. Um, and then the final co comment I had was that um, somebody did bring up that, you know, there may be other yards that have been turned into parking lots, but just because we've done that in the past is not a reason to continue doing it. We've done a lot of things in the past that we don't still do, like draining wetlands um, uh, and, you know, building buildings on them, which we, part, part of this neighborhood is kind of in that situation right now, which is one of the reasons we flood. Um, and I just respectfully request that the petition be denied. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Mr. Crystal Reddy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Chris Loretti. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. I'm at uh, 56 Adams Street. I'm not in, in the immediate neighborhood, but I do live in a neighborhood of two-family homes. And as those of us who live in these types of neighborhoods know, um, it's quite common for some houses to have single-width driveways and some to have double-width. That's just a fact of life. And this is the situation this developer finds himself in is not at all unique. Um, the, what people do is you just put a garage or a widened area towards the back of the lot in order to, um, you know, have two cars that can park side by side. But what you don't do is, is pave over the rear yard. And, you know, frankly, I don't care whether permeable pavers are used or whether it's paved with gold. This is an excellent reason why we need the usable open space bylaw and why town meeting should not remove it. It clearly provides benefits to the neighbors to have that there. I don't think um, I or anyone else should have to look out my kitchen window and see a parking lot in my neighbor's backyard. And I, I, I certainly share the concern of the neighbors of this particular house. So, you know, frankly, I think this is a really big reach. Um, I don't know what the town's doing in putting out its um, legal notices, because clearly this did require a variance. And I would also say, I think the applicant is probably overstating the gross floor, floor area of the house and therefore the amount of usable open space that's needed. So I, I certainly hope you will. You know, finally, the other thing I was gonna say is in looking at this neighborhood, it's not at all uncommon for houses just to have single width driveways. So not, again, it's nothing unique, but I really hope the board um, will recognize the importance of maintaining the uh, usable open space bylaw and speak against the article that's coming up at town meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Um, uh, somebody in the waiting room. Um, Mr. Gilroy is the applicant. I'm going to pass you by just for another member of the public, uh, Mr. Fleming. Hi, James Fleming, 50, uh, 58 Oxford Street. Um, what the to me the environmental argument doesn't matter as much because under usable open space that space doesn't have to be green and environmentally conscious it can be a patio, a patio that's paved or it can be a swimming pool the only requirement is that it isn't parking so in this case if the developer just put a patio in back there it would be equally as environmentally destructive it's just that we wouldn't be having this conversation um and then the other one other thing is to mr loretti's point they could do a wider area in the back, but if the measurements are to be believed, they have literally no ability to modify their backyard without running into the usable open space requirement. So it, there, there is just no option available to them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, may I say something? Chris, Bob and Essie? Uh, Mr. Inessi? Yes. Uh, our intent from day one was to, in fact, go before the Conservation Commission but uh, in speaking uh, with Mr. Champer, it was suggested that uh, 
perhaps what they ought to do is see whether they could uh, get uh, zoning relief with respect to parking first. They are in the 100 uh, uh, year flood zone, so they have to go before conservation in any event. So even if they did get and do get relief from the zoning board, the Conservation Commission is going to have something to say about conditions on the lot as well. But again, we don't get to that if we don't get uh, by the Zoning Board of Appeal. So again, I, I'm reiterating uh, my request yeah. for, and my client's request for a continuance uh, at this point, a reasonable continuance. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address this application? Um, I believe, Mr. Loretti, your hand is still up, I think, from before. Um, and Ms. Torbert is, is, just, her, Ms. Torbert is was, requesting to address this a second time. So, Ms. Torbert? Yes, uh, Ms. Clinton, I, I'm just wanting to confirm that the members of the board have access to my written comments as well. We do, yes. Okay, all right. Yes. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, with that, if there are no further members of the public who wish to address, I will go ahead and close the public comment period um, of this hearing. Um, and we'll turn Mr. Alex Giller. Um, if you had a, did you have a, something you had wanted to raise? Uh, I did. So I just want to address a couple of the public comments, if that's possible, quickly. Um, if, if I can yeah. share my screen, I can show you the abutting properties that actually do have parking in the rear and, for that matter, are paved. Um, and that's why we wanted to do um, permeable pavers as in a try to be some sort of middle ground. I mean, we, paving, obviously, is cheaper. It's easier. It's faster. But we also know that it's not best for the environment. We do know that we back up to a, a wetland and we are in the buffer zone for the floodplain. So we are trying to make um, certain design choices that it will, will be as beneficial as we can. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm able to, I'm trying to share my screen, but it's saying it's disabled. Right. So I would need to ask Ms. Ralston to let you, uh, to make you a co-host so you can share. Could be all set. Nope. Sorry, the other one, the other Giller. Sorry. So it needs to be Alex Giller, not David Giller. There we go. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, Alex, you should have permission to share. There we go. So if you can look here on this screen, you can see that uh, one third, or excuse me, so to point out, so the red dot on the screen, that is our property, 106, 108. If you look uh, diagonally across to the left and diagonally across to the right, so we have 113, 115, we have 109, 111, and we have 101, 103, all with substantial amounts of parking uh, in their backyard that is all paved. Um, they do not meet the open space requirement to the naked eye. Um, I, I honestly, I don't know what process they went through in order to achieve this. I do know 109, 111 was repaved and was a condo conversion in 2021, um, which should be relatively recent and relevant um, to this project. And that's why we thought that this was just as simple yeah. as, um, you know, getting a special permit um, while also appeasing the requests of Conservation Commission. Um, I would like to address the flooding concern. I mean, right now the cars are currently parked as deep to the back of the property as they would be with our proposed parking plan. So it, it's basically whether the cars are kind of centered in the yard versus along the fence. But at the end of the day, the same amount of contaminants would still spill in if that's a concern, no matter where they are parked in this driveway, because that one event where the pump failed in 2010 would have gone, you know, covered probably 80% of our driveway as it currently stands. Um, and then uh, one other thing, so with the Conservation Commission, we actually have gone to front and they did want us to, that's how we um, clarified everything with Mike Champa as to the avenue 
that we need to go forward and conservation commission actually also said but i don't have that in writing that this is probably a special permit that we should be addressing first before talking to them with that said they also did have some of the same concerns that diane had and were happy to address such as uh dealing with snow removal maintenance of those permeable pavers it sounds like that is all going to be terms are of our, our approval if we do get that far uh, with the conservation commission because that is also something that they had um on their minds as well and we're happy to agree with um we've also reached out to all the neighbors we've sent letters ourselves uh, in addition to what's been provided from the town um to simply say hey this is what we're trying to do we're happy for feedback i've reached out to diane personally both in person and an email several times i i understand she lives there you know she's lived there for 30 years i hope she lives there for another 30 years we we're gone after this project we want to make this something that she is okay with and i've tried getting feedback from her in order to get uh landscaping ideas or offer to have her pick the tree for the backyard whatever it may be i'm trying to make it a better situation for everybody and so it, it i understand that it's not ideal to be looking at cars in a backyard but we are trying to do our best to make the best to the situation so just wanted to address a few of those comments thank you Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm gonna have you go ahead and close the share. Thanks. Um, so we what we have before us right now is a um it's a request for continuance um on this application. Um, are there any other questions from the board before we um consider that okay so um the applicant requested a continuance um I think you know from the board's perspective it it would be worthwhile for us as well to have an opportunity to speak with inspectional services and find out exactly um their their reasoning for uh suggesting this is a special permit um you know, it's very possible that we have this wrong as well. So um, with that in mind, I would move to continue the, um, the hearing for 106 Varnum Street until Tuesday. May 23rd, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So vote of the board Mr. to continue. Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I yes. ask you a question? Mr. Uh, Hanlon, yes. I'm a little bit, un I'm, I'm getting mixed up on dates a little bit. Uh, but I'm wondering whether after the meeting that we had earlier to plan out the sequence of events on uh, for 10 Sunnyside, whether yeah. the 23rd is available to us, because I have this feeling thought, it might not be. I thought they had requested the 16th. That, I think you're right. Okay. okay. I just wanted to be sure. Yeah. So this is a motion to continue the hearing for 106 Varnum Street until Tuesday, May 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Um, it's put forward by the chair, seconded by Mr. Hanlon. Uh, so then a vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli is not with us this evening. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 106 Varnum Street. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Uh, this brings us where up to the agenda. Here's the agenda. This brings us to docket 3746-25 Teal Street. Um, so if I could ask uh, the applicants to introduce themselves and uh, tell us what they are proposing. Uh, we have two applicants here at different locations. Uh, okay. So I'll introduce myself first. I'm Carolyn Salvi. I am one of the 
owners and uh, residents of 25 Teal Street. Uh, the other owner who is here uh, is Rachel Gray, who is uh, owns 25% of the property and is a non-resident. Um, so we bought this house in fall of 21, um, at which point, uh, or at the point at which we bought it, this was not true, but at the point at which we put in the offer, um, the house though zoned as a two family was being rented as four separate rental units uh, by the previous owner. Um, so she had subdivided the first floor that was being rented as two separate units the second and third floor. It's a, the house is a 1890s mansard with a large addition off to one side. It's on a wide lot. Um, so she was renting the second and third floor as a unit. And then there is a um, converted garage in the back yard uh, that was being rented as a studio. Um, so we put the house back to its intended zoned state as a two family. Um, the people that we initially bought this house with, uh, were unable to stay in the property and we bought them out in December of 22. And we would like to ask for a special permit to rent out, um, the ADU, the accessory dwelling unit in the backyard. Um, we would, uh, of course need to get a certificate of occupancy for that. Um, so we would need to put work back into it to put a kitchen uh, to make it a livable space. Um, it other, and the reason we need um, a special permit is because the ADU is within 10 feet of the property line um, on two sides of us. Um, the neighbors uh, one over, uh, we're at 25, so I believe they wouldn't be 27. When I spoke to them directly about it, they said, oh, we had no idea that it wasn't legally rented before now. We've never had any problem with tenants in there. It's been being rented out the entire time we've lived in this house. Um, we, uh, the neighbors behind us have raised no objections. We distributed letters. Um, so aside from it not being um, <clears throat> as, as set far back from the property line as, as requested, it, it should otherwise be pretty conforming. Um, again, because it was being rented, uh, not properly before by previous owners, uh, in some ways, this is sort of, we're asking for a previous grant thing to be grandfathered in, uh, more properly. Um, we have no reason to believe that this would place any additional burden on public utilities. And we already have um, six spaces of off-street parking. So uh, we would certainly be able to accommodate parking for a tenant back there in addition to the tenants that we now have in the second and third floor unit. Yep. So I will introduce myself too. Um, I'm Rachel Gray. Carolyn has already covered my involvement in the property. I basically helped the Selvies buy out their previous neighbors in December, and we are working toward renting out the property, including this ADU. The only thing I would add to what Carolyn said is that the ADU, which is clearly a one-time conversion from a two-car garage, it's already built. We're not requesting any new construction. It actually already has hooked up gas, electricity, water. The only thing it doesn't have is basically we would need to throw in a kitchen sink and a fridge to make it livable. So this is not a request for any major new construction. It will not change the amount of open space. We don't even need to make new parking spots. The only things that we seek relief on are the two issues of it being within actually six feet of the lot line and also only two of the three owners are resident. So one question we had, so the way that the ownership works now, is it yes. that one person owns one unit and one person owns the other unit or is it sort of all combined? Uh, it is one mortgage mm -hmm. on a two family. It is 
Um, so it is not, so my husband and I own 75% of the total yep. property and Rachel owns 25% of the total, total property. Okay. Yep. We're all on the deed and the husband and I are both on the mortgage. Okay. And I'm not owning the mortgage only because I don't make money that makes me useful to have on a mortgage application. <laughs> so the section that this is falls under, and the only reason that they need to be in front of us, um, as they had noted, um, so this is 592B bullet five, I think, three, four, five, subsection triple I. So an, an accessory dwelling unit may be located in an accessory building which accessory building shall not constitute a principal or main building by the incorporation of the accessory dwelling unit, provided that if such accessory building is located within six feet of a lot line, then such accessory dwelling unit shall be allowed only if the Board of Appeals acting pursuant to 3.3 grants a special permit upon its finding that the creation of such accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of such accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. Um, so that's what we need to determine, but in sort of doing research on this, we're going through the requirements uh, for an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and uh, essentially it, an accessory dwelling unit needs to be accessory to a principal dwelling. So it's a little, it, in a standard two family situation, it's easy because it's a single owner, um, which it goes to, if it's a straight condo, it's easy because one unit has one owner, the other unit has a different owner, we can, it's easy to assign. It's a little more fuzzy in this case because we have sort of essentially an ownership group with where most of them are resident, but we it's not clear to clearly defined which unit of 25 Teal Street is affiliate is going to be affiliated with. Yes. Because um, we can't just do it blanket for the property, by the way, the bylaw appears to be written. So we would just want to clarify which unit it would be associated with. It would be and associated would likely... with unit. It would be associated with unit two. Okay. Um, which is the unit that in our in our sort of uh, collective conception, although this may not be entirely no, it is clear mm -hmm. in the legal legal framework, I believe. Uh, that's the one that Rachel owns. Okay. Half of. Does that make sense? Yes. So that the Salvies own yeah. seventy five percent of the total building. They own all of Unit One and half of Unit yeah. Two. Okay. And Rachel owns half of Unit Two. Okay. We yeah. um. We may well, we, we have talked about a condo conversion, but mm -hmm. because of the financial uh, picture at the moment, um, yeah. that doesn't make sense to do for us financially unless interest rates drop, at which point, you know, we can right. do that. Yeah. No, by my reading of the ADU laws, you can actually have an ADU associated with a one family or a two family house. Yep. That is what this is. I did not see that one can be associated with a condo unit. So my, by my reading, it is okay to associate it with the two family house, but condoizing might bring us back in front of you again. Right. Um, but the, the way the law is written, um, the, in order to have an accessory dwelling, so you can have, if on a single family property, you have a single house that is owner occupied and an accessory dwelling unit that's rented out, or you have a, an accessory dwelling unit where the owner resides and the, then the primary dwelling becomes the rental unit, uh, because the bylaw requires that the resident, that one of the two be owner occupied, um, and so I'm a little, I, I sort of be a little curious what the board thinks about this, where I think in this situation, if it was affiliated with unit one, where which is clearly owner occupied, that would be simple. But if it's affiliated with 
unit number two, it is 50-50 ownership where, but neither of them are resident in that unit. And my concern is that if we, that that would not be allowable under the bylaw. Jim? Mr. Hanlon. Could you point to the provision in the bylaw that requires uh, someone to actually be a resident in that unit? Because the, the, what I'm looking for, it's a, looking at is it says an accessory dwelling unit shall not be owned separately from the principal dwelling unit with which such uh, accessory dwelling unit is associated. But it doesn't say anything about who's residing where, and I'm trying to see what the where the effective language is. Am I reading this wrong? So I know that the accessory dwelling unit shall not be owned separately from the principal dwelling unit with which such accessory dwelling unit is associated. That's the one that sort of drives that it has to be affiliated with a dwelling unit in order to be an accessory dwelling unit. Um, when, prior to the issuance of a building permit for an accessory dwelling unit, this is uh, sub C1. The owner must deliver an affidavit to the building inspector stating that the owner or a family member of the owner will reside in either the principal dwelling unit or the accessory dwelling unit upon completion of the accessory dwelling unit. So just so that is 592C1. So in so far as it is possible to treat the ex mm -hmm. the existing accessory dwelling unit yeah as an accessory dwelling unit to the whole property certainly <laughs> but i don't think we can do it to the property because the b4 says an accessory dwelling unit shall not be owned separately from the principal, the principal dwelling unit with which such accessory dwelling unit is associated. So your property has two dwelling units. So you can't assign it to both dwelling units. It has to be assigned to one because it says the principal dwelling unit. Okay. Okay. If it, if it legally needs to be associated with unit one, mm -hmm. what restriction does that really place on us? None whatsoever, I think. I mean, that uh, seems fine then. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. I mean, we've had so few of these. I, I'm not surprised that we're sort of working on these as we go. And I looking at the language of 5.92 uh, A2, it says helping Arlington residents to conserve and grow their own property mm -hmm. values. And I know Mr. Hanlon asked the question about whether somebody had to be resident in the building, or I think that was the question. And, and I think at least, you know, from the beginning when we were dealing with these not that long ago, when, when it started, I was of the impression that it had to be somebody who was living there as a resident who would then be having a an accessory unit associated with their principal unit. And I suspect that there are variations of interpretation here. So I'm not saying that I'm 100% right, but that's just my sort of feel or take for it. So I do think that since there are residents in the unit one, that I think at least would address the concerns that we have, whether or not it clears up the question, the answer to the question for all time, I don't know. But I think that that would at least be a workaround if if we needed yeah. to. So, so I and, had a conversation with with uh, with Doug Heim, town council, about this because the, the, the question was raised about having about the, the way the ownership works. Um, and he was not entirely sure how to do it either. And I had approached him at last night during the break of town meeting and just said, you know, we've got this case. Um, but the approach that that I think we can work with is if we can assign it to one unit and that is the unit that has the residents resident in it, then it becomes very clean. Then it is really just 
there's a, we just need to make a determination that using the building at the back as an accessory dwelling unit is not more detrimental than its current condition or the condition that it would be if it was a garage, um, then that's the only determination that needs to be made by the board. So it's Mr. That, Chairman. It's that, yes, Mr. Hanlon. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I was just saying, thinking that that if in fact we proceeded with this and and we're going to approve it, we could include as a condition in the special permit that it would be associated with the, with a unit. In which case, when that's filed, it establishes a legal record as to which is the principal unit for which it's, so that you don't have a situation where where there's musical chairs down the line that it keeps on being thrown back from one from one to the next and and then that will make would make it, uh, the situation clear going forward as to what the principal unit was so you you're saying we could do a condition where we say that the accessory dwelling unit is accessory to whichever of the two units is owner occupied well i would i don't know that i would do that i, I mean my to, the, to me, at least, the, the clearest thing to do here is to be able to is to find a way of having somebody make an election as to the which is the, the which is the principal dwelling that's associated with the ADU, and I would my inclination, but maybe this is just being overly legalistic, is that once you make that election, you're stuck with it. So, at that point, you've you've got you you now have identified the uh, the principal unit. And that unit then eventually has to, you know, comply with the provisions of, of the ordinance and you of the bylaw, and you don't care about the other one. Hmm. Mr. Chairman, if I could add to the confusion yeah, a little bit. Please. Um, so, you know, when people are making reference to unit, I understand that it's sort of shorthand, but to me, unit means a condominium unit when you talk about a two-family structure, mm -hmm. and and I wasn't clear on that myself. So I think from what the applicants have said, it's not yet condoized if if it ever would be. Right. So so it strikes me that if you had an actual condominium, and all of the other conditions were met, each of the condominiums could have its own ADU. Right. That is and, correct. And, and so I think in some ways. You know, we're sort of trying to nibble at the edges a little bit and say, okay, well now, and I think it's right, we have to sort of assign this to one of the, you know, units, so-called. Um, but in some ways, it's really, <laughs> it, it's not just, it's not a unit yet, is all I'm saying. It's sort of not matured, but I don't think that we need to do any more than what you suggested, which is just find that it's not more detrimental. Because I think there are clearly gray areas in this, you know, that we'll be dealing with for some time to come. Okay. Any other questions at the moment from the board? Uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. LeBlanc? Uh, just wondering too, is it something that we should ask for to get um, plans of the unit once it's ready for occupying? Um, because like, as they mentioned, even in their presentation, also the, the letter from the town um, that there currently isn't a kitchen in that, right. so it can't be actually rented. So I think it would be good for us to have on the record of what their proposed condition is going to be. We can certainly re request that through a condition. Um, so this time I'm going to go ahead and I think it, we should go ahead and have take public comment. Um, so public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and to be used to, to uh, directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Uh, if you'd like to speak, you may raise your hand digitally using the button in the reactions tab, or you may dial star nine if you're calling in by phone. Um, so with that, uh, Daniel Peterson. Uh, hello again, Daniel Peterson, uh, 38 Teal Street, um, just across the way and, and down the road from the Selby's. Um, just uh, again, point of clarification. I remember when this unit went for sale, it was being purported as a three property 
home. It's zoned as a two family home. It was sold that way. We subsequently learned that it's perhaps a, a four family unit. My understanding is a garage, et cetera, not rentable, which would be the reason you can't get a permit for a kitchen or a bathroom. Um, how does this relate to the additional dwelling unit uh, situation? Because I'm sure tons of people would convert their garages to guest houses. Yep. Uh, please inform. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, so accessory dwelling units were approved by town meeting two years ago, might've been three. Um, and there are certain criteria it has to be less than 900 square feet. Um, it, it has to have its own separate entrance. Um, the several other, it has to fully comply with the building code. Um, in this situation, if it is within six feet of a property line, it needs to get us, uh, get approval from the zoning board of appeals. Um, the part of the idea behind it is that Arlington is somewhat notorious for having lots of off the books units. Um, and this is an attempt to try that first and foremost, this is an attempt to try to increase the housing um, in our housing opportunities in Arlington and hopefully housing opportunities that are smaller and less and more affordable than um, than sort of your standard units in town. It was also an attempt to try and hopefully make situations with people who are uh, you know land rich and cash poor where all of their equity is in their house and they're looking for a way to live on the property but gain some some value from the property as well. Um, so if if you're doing it within your house, you don't even need a special, if, as a part of your house, you don't need a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. You can just go straight to the building department and work with them on creating it. Um, so they, they, the only reason this is before us today is because it is within six feet of the property line. Um, by the zone, by the, building department, what makes it a dwelling unit is effectively that it has a stove. Um, if you have a garage with a bathroom, that's not uh, that's not illegal. You can have a water service to your garage. You can have electric service to your garage. Um, but as soon as you put a, a stove in, it becomes a dwelling unit. And so, um, you know, the, where which is why you know, this not currently doesn't have a kitchen, so it doesn't currently qualify as a dwelling unit. Um, but then they would be uh, adding that back, adding that in, um, should they get the special approval from the board um, to move forward on that? Does, does that address your question? I think it does. I'm, I'm a new resident, love Arlington, Wisconsin boy, you know, uh, Cambridge educated here in town and happy to be in the neighborhood. But one of the things that has be, been beat into us is that Parking is terrible. Can't park in the street overnight. Got to yep. try and figure this stuff out. And there are no additional dwelling units, I thought. No guest houses. You know, I just did an external garage. So I'm just sitting here, full disclosure, thinking like, sounds to me like I could rent out my garage, but I know it's not that easy. What's the difference here? I didn't need to get mm -hmm. rezoned, right? Like, that's what all the neighbors on Teal Street are yeah. curious about. How do we go from a one or a two family to all of a sudden renting three or four units additionally to the primary right. residents? Right. So the the ADU bylaw does restrict you to one accessory dwelling unit per uh, principal dwelling unit, and it's only I think it's only available in the one and two family districts. So uh, the most that could be on a single property is four, and that's only if it has two exist if it's in a two family district in a single family district there can only be two units so that's sort of what restricts the the overall number that could be created this law came into effect i think you said um two, two years, years ago, ago. yeah have you seen a, a flood of these is this like i don't want to i'm not holding things up i'm excited for my neighbor to... <laughs> Uh, from housing is town. tough. I mean, there have been, I'm in a two family. I have my former nanny living downstairs. I mean, it's great, but this I'm is just... the third case that's come before the zoning board um, for being close to the property line. How many have gone that have not required that? I 
have no idea. It is not a big number from my understanding. But I mean, is it is it fair to assume that it's like when that law went into effect, the longstanding kind of um, deterrent mm -hmm. for increased housing, it opened and all of a sudden it went from a no-go to like, these are mostly going through. Like you can, you can convert a garage, you can build an additional dwelling unit externally mm -hmm. for a two family. Could you build one unit and split it and have it be half and half? And now you're at four families. Like Mr. this is the Mr. can Chairman. of worms that, that people are going <laughs> to open. I'm curious. Mr. About. Chairman, yeah. Mr. Hanlon, I, I'm, I, at this point, I'm, I'd like to sort of use the word scope. But we're we're now yeah. kind of debating the implications of the zoning bylaw, and I'd suggest that Mr. Peters take a look at it. Uh, and it's it's in the bylaw itself, and uh, you can look up accessory dwelling unit and it tells you all about it. The purpose was to actually promote these. And uh, so it's not a bad thing when people do it. Mostly it's a bad thing when they have to come to us uh, because that that is a barrier to doing it, but they have to, for certain circumstances, particularly when they get within six feet of the lot line for a separated building. And so it, it has not been an overwhelming, it, and, and practically in nowhere has it been an overwhelming uh, a flood of these kinds of things because it's expensive to make them typically. Uh, and uh, so, but beyond that, I think we ought to try to focus on on this particular case and see mm -hmm. uh, if we can make some progress towards resolving this one. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Oh, Mr. Peterson, you're on mute. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Patton, respectfully, did not mean to waste time at all. I hear you, I know it's late. Um, I'm, I love Arlington. I'm excited about the community and I'm excited if you guys, if this is, if we're approving this, like full disclosure as a private citizen, hundred percent on board. Um, but just want to understand the implications as well. And like, if you guys are generally on board with this, I just, I, I wasn't sure. I thought that there might be opposition, but that's amazing to hear. So there might I will uh, take no more of your time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, uh, Daniel Rosenblatt. Hi, um, my name is Daniel Rosenblatt at 29 Teal Street. I'm Carolyn's, uh, Carolyn Salvi's neighbor, neighbor right next door. We're right on the lot line here and I'm, I'm uh, appearing here to support her, her permit. I, I think you should, I think it's great that they're legalizing this residence that as long as we've been here for 15 years before Carolyn was rented out um, to a tenant. And I think uh, it's great that she's legalizing it. And um, you know, we need more, more housing in Arlington. Um, we understand that, uh, that Carolyn uh, doesn't intend to expand the footprint or add a second story to the existing adjacent dwelling unit. However, if the property changes hands, new, owner, new owners might not have the same intentions and we would request that the permit expressly exclude expanding on the footprint or adding an additional floor, as that would impinge on the character of their neighborhood, the privacy of far dwelling, and would adversely affect the value of our home. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, as an accessory building, it is limited to 20 feet in height. Um, so, but we can, we can certainly consider um, your recommendation for including um, a condition about adding a second floor. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Um, are there other members of the public who wish to address this here? I know Ms. Salvi has her hand up, but she gets to speak anyways. She's the, as the applicant. So are there any other members of the public who wish to address this? Seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public comment period on this hearing. Um, so I, the, the, the matter really before the board is um, whether using the existing garage at the rear of the property, which has a history of um, various uses, whether using that um, as an accessory dwelling unit would um, be more detrimental than uh, the use of it as a garage. Um, so I'm just going to quickly switch over to um, the right document. Yes. 
So this is the um, the memorandum from the Department of Planning and, and Community Development. Um, so it notes that the existing structure on the property, which is in the R2, has some nonconformities because the accessory belt building is located within six feet of the left and rear side lines. Um, the board may grant a special permit provided it finds the creation of the ADU is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of the accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. Applicant is not increasing the footprint or height of the existing structures. The proposal would not increase any of the existing nonconformities. Um, and so in their application of the special permit criteria, uh, requested use is permitted through a special permit in the R2 zoning district since the existing accessory structure is located less than six feet from the property line. Proposal would provide an ADU to allow the owners to earn supplemental income through investment in their property. Uh, and number three, that would not in be an increase in traffic congestion or an impairment in public safety. Um, an AD, uh, under the bylaw, an ADU is not required to have an additional parking space affiliated with it. Um, but uh, even, even if it were, it would not, uh, because of the small size of the unit, it won't be an increase of a single vehicle. Um, criteria number four, undue burden, uh, would not be an undue burden on municipal services. Uh, criteria number five, so special regulations, if granted by a special permit, the proposal would meet the required conditions for ADUs under 592B1. Um, so the floor area of the proposed ADU is less than the maximum floor area requirement, which is 900 square feet. Uh, due to its proposed size, the size, it is not a large addition and therefore not subject to 542B6. Um, it would have its own separate entrance. Uh, this would be the first ADU established on this property and a maximum of two would be allowed. Uh, an ADU are allowed in accessory buildings, in this case, subject to the granting of a special permit. The ADU would not be used as a short-term rental and the ADU is subject to state building code and state fire code. Uh, criteria six, uh, while the accessory building is located less than six feet from the abutting properties, the proposal to create the ADU is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use as a garage. Nearest structure on an abutting property is also an accessory garage. Three family and two family homes are located in its immediate vicinity. The B1 zone lies approximately 200 feet to the south at Mass Ave. Accessory building is located entirely behind the principal dwelling in the rear yard of the property. Overall, the proposal would not detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district or the adjoining districts, nor will be detrimental to the health, morals, or welfare of the neighbors of the property. And it would not cause any detrimental excess of a particular use. Um, so this is the property here, and the garage is this small corner back here um, from the street. Oh. In Google Street View, the tree is still there, and now it's gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's gone because it was a Norway maple, and we asked the city to take it away because those are invasive. Ah, uh, indeed. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, wonder if the chair could could inquire of Ms. Salvi whether she's agreeable to the condition that her neighbors has uh, proposed to um, not to include another a second story. Absolutely. We are 100% agreeable to that. We have no intention to do any construction on the ADU aside from bringing it up to the level needed to get a certificate of occupancy. Uh, uh, and and uh, that just means putting in a, a, a kitchen sink, a stove and a refrigerator. Um, it is already fully plumbed. It has its own gas meter. Uh, we do not want to increase the footprint. We like our big yard. We're very excited about it. Um, we're in fact about to remove what the previous owner had created as a gravel parking lot in the back. We're about to make it green and not gravel, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate the support from, from Daniel Greenblatt and uh, hi, Mr. Peterson. 38, nice to meet you. Um, so yeah, I mean, we absolutely want to just be increasing the housing stock, the affordable housing stock and, and 
you know, helping defray the cost of having to buy the second half of the house. Yeah, and as co-owner, I agree with that completely. I do have some photos of the ADU from the inside. If I could share a Ooh. link somewhere, it may not matter, but the inside is actually really nice. It has a little bit of a gabled roof. There's a skylight in there. It's a little bit extra tall. So adding a second story to it, I think would actually harm its character and we don't want that. Okay, thank you. Um, I did have one question on that. So are the windows that are in the, in the garage or in the studio, do those face onto the property or do they face budding properties? They all face into the property and there's okay. also a Perfect. Um, are there any further questions from the board? Hearing none. Um, so were the board to uh, approve or vote to approve this special permit, we would have our three you know, the three standard conditions make sure they make sense. Um, I think so. So these are the three standards that we've read into the hearing prior. Um, and then Mr. Hanlon, there was, we sort of had a couple different opinions about how to condition the, um, which unit it's associated with. Did you have specific language in mind? Mr. Chairman, I, I sort of was persuaded by Mr. DuPont, unless he changes his position like I'm about to, uh, that we might as well just, at this point, it was, especially when you have the building itself is under common ownership, it, it's as it, there's a single, there's, a, there's an undivided interest that it, then everybody has a proportional interest in that. It might be better, in, I, I think in my view, it would be better to uh, not specify which is the dwelling unit that it's attached to. At some point, one or the other of uh, of the dwelling units will probably go pass into the hands of someone else, or mm -hmm. maybe there'll be another ADU built here. But either way, uh, I don't really see any very good reason for for uh, limiting their flexibility uh, uh, later on and and deciding that question when it's right for them and when they can do it in the best way that that is suitable for all the owners here. So I'd, I'd sort of pet, take a pass on that and and uh, let them later on decide if as the as the time comes, uh, which is the uh, which is the primary unit to it, that it's addressed to. But if the board were were thought differently from that, I think that the wording could be as simple as the ADU unit will be uh, attached will be affiliated with whatever the language of the statute affiliated with the principal unit, which would be unit one or unit two as the, as the case may be. But I think we might be able to, it might be just as well to avoid that. Okay. Yeah, because the two, the two paragraphs, it's B4, the accessory dwelling unit shall not be owned separately from the principal dwelling unit with which such accessory dwelling unit is associated sort of implies that it needs to be affiliated with a single dwelling unit. Um, and then C1, prior to the issuance of a building permit for an accessory dwelling unit, the owner must deliver an affidavit to the building inspector stating the owner or a family member of the owner will reside in either the principal or the accessory. Um, So, Mr. Chairman, yes, if we want the language that would seem to me to work would be that the uh, the accessory dwelling unit uh, shall be uh, shall be associated with unit with uh, dwelling unit one. I think that's the one that that yeah. is the more unambiguous thing. If you wanted to do that and the applicant was comfortable doing that, then then that that would nail it down, then it, then you could, at this point, if that that makes it clear, I mean, that makes it clear that you're not dealing with a partial interest, I mean, which raises a separate kind of legal problem of what happens when someone, I mean, suppose for, that it wasn't just a, a person and her, and her 
you could have five or six people all invest in one unit. And if any one of them lived in it, maybe that would that would count. And uh, so it's not clear where that goes. And Mr. DuPont is right that there's lots of things that are not clear about the bylaw as we begin to actually see it go into effect. But in any event, the language I just indicated that the accessory dwelling unit shall be considered associated with unit one, if that's the right one, uh, would, would solve that problem. I would agree with that. We can either condition you know, the accessory dwelling unit shall be associated with the dwelling unit number one, i.e. 25 Teal Street number one, or we could say something a little more fuzzy, like for the purposes of complying with section 524, uh, 592B4, the accessory dwelling unit shall be considered associated, shall be considered associated with dwelling unit number one. Um, the thought there just being that it's not as, we're sort of saying that we're associating it with one with the one unit for the purposes of complying with the, with the bylaw as opposed to directly assigning it. I think that would be fine. Okay. Uh, if I may interject, uh, we, the owners, are have had our own, you know, back channel. That sounds mm -hmm. much worse than I mean it. Uh, <laughs> conversation, uh, and we're we're fine with associating it with Unit One. Okay. Well, in that case, that is a far cleaner solution. So we'll go ahead and just do that. Um, and then the. Planning department memo had, uh, and uh, Mr. LeBlanc had recommended that we um, uh, that we request a revised drawing indicating the locate indicating the location of the kitchen. Um, we'll be happy. To okay, I just we I just, have. We have one that's not perfectly to scale and is not professionally done. Yeah. That we could actually screen share if you wanted. Well, we certainly, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out because we can't make it contingent on the issuance of the building permit because it's using a local bylaw to supersede a state bylaw. Um, so I'm wondering if we should just leave it up to the building inspector to take care of that or if we do want to still include it as a condition. How's the board feel on that? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. The I mean, I think it is useful to have the to have the information revealed, but the the truth is is that the plan for the kitchen and 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 the interior organization of the unit is not really going to be material to our decision in this case. And rather than weigh this down this down with conditions that are really much more contingent, I think it would be better just to uh, just to request the applicant to provide those drawings and and so to the building inspector and let it go at that. Okay. And then the last one was there was the uh, request about a um, about not adding a second floor in the future. Um, I recommend that we that we condition that any addition to the gross floor area of the accessory dwelling unit shall require the approval of the zoning board of appeals. I think that's right, Mr. Chairman. I had a concern that we're imposing a condition. Uh, that we wouldn't ordinarily be authorized to impose if we limited mm -hmm. it, you know, specifically to not going up. And 
you know, that's notwithstanding Mr. Rosenblatt's concern. I get that part of it, but I don't want to overstep our bounds. And to the extent that, you know, there's compliance with the bylaw, I think that the applicants would have a right to go in and to speak to the building department, unless because we've already had to deal with this because of the location within six feet of the property line, mm -hmm. that we would be necessarily making that same sort of a, a determination that it wasn't more detrimental. So I, I think what you just said sort of incorporates that concept that if they're going to increase the footprint um, or they're going to increase the gross floor area, that that is a bit of a difference that mm -hmm. we would need to take another look at. Yeah, I mean, you could sort of infer from us having a condition that the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the grant of the special permit that it would automatically carry that if you tried to, if you change the, the accessory building that it would cause necessarily that you would have to come back. But I think having it be a little bit more explicit is helpful. Right. Good. Um, are there any other conditions that the board <coughs> feel would be important to include. Okay, so then there are three conditions. Uh, there's the three standards. Uh, then uh, number four would be the accessory dwelling unit shall be associated with the dwelling unit number three, i.e. 25 Teal Street number one. And then the third, the fifth would be that any addition to the gross floor area of the accessory dwelling unit shall require the approval of the Zoning Board of Appeals. So unless there's anything else, the board, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the uh, board approve the application subject to the uh, conditions that the chair has just referred to. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board to um, approve special permit for 25 Teal Street with the five conditions, creating an accessory dwelling unit in the existing uh, garage slash studio structure at the rear of the property. Um, so vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Uh, in the absence of Mr. Riccardelli, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, that special permit is approved for 25 Teal Street. Thank Great. you so much for your time and attention. Oh, you are yes. very welcome. Thanks You're for welcome. the help. You're quite welcome. Thank you both. Uh, with that, um, I'm going back to my agenda for tonight. Um, Oh, here we go. Um, so earlier this evening, we uh, closed the public hearing on um, 1021, 1025, or I guess 1021, 1027 Massachusetts Avenue, so we should be calling it. Um, so we will, I'll send around a, an email to the board looking for when we can try to meet to uh, have hearings on, uh, to discuss the decision on that. Um, but our next scheduled meeting will be Tuesday, May 2nd, where we will uh, have the opening session for um, 10 Sunnyside Avenue, which is another uh, comprehensive permit, this one on behalf of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Uh, and then on the Tuesday, May 16th, we will have the second hearing on that property. And then Tuesday, May 23rd, will be the next regular meeting for the board. Um, so that is our our schedule going forward. Any any questions from the board? No. no. Seeing none, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Colleen Ralston for setting up not this meeting, but two meetings this evening and running them both. Um, and also thanking Marissa, uh, Marisa Lau for her assistance in preparing uh, the uh, memoranda from the planning board. Uh, please note that the purpose of the board's recording this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. 
If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's I meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night. everyone. Good night. Mr. Moore, I'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs>